This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Do we have Hans Arden? I need to wait a minute or so just to get the Hans Arden people back into the, the room now. So we can, we can move on then to the uh, open session agenda then, okay, can I just do the usual, for, obviously formally welcome everyone into the room this morning to attend the committee, um, <coughs> those members then just to make sure they switch off all the electronic devices and so on, yes, um, got some. and the main members of the protocols around the tablets and, and other electronic devices. Okay, and again, if people are referring to the documents, uh, if they could use the numbers on the, the electronic uh, pages, if possible, um, to help each other in the room. Okay, so uh, if they ask any member in the room to declare any interest relevant to the agenda today, none to declare, we can move on to apologies. There's no apologies to declare. Okay, we'll have enough to move on then to the draft minutes of the uh, meeting on the 9th of January, on page 6 of your pack. Members consent to note the minutes for accuracy. Okay, take it as a Thank you very much. Moving on to uh, item number three, chairperson business. Just to uh, just basically suggest to members that obviously um, next week's agenda we've tried to keep it a light schedule, given that we're going to deal with the um, the forward work program in relation to uh, the a range of issues in terms of the primarily the inquiry and then the social housing program and so on. So. Uh, Members happy enough then that we will review the, the former work programme um, next week then on the back of the uh, discussion we have because we, we had hoped to have a plan in there at the beginning of this session that really didn't happen. So if we can, notwithstanding the fact that we're doing the inquiry stock take next week and other matters that we can try and have that strategic discussion about the former work programme next week, we'll try and do our best on that. We're happy enough for that. Okay, just to try to make sure that we're also proactive and we're not responding to things as well. Okay, um, again, next week we're just, uh, this session next week will, will, quite a lot of next week's session will be in a uh, low session, so there's no schedules, no briefings from schedule for that day um, to allow us to deal with our, our business in closed session. Okay, and again, uh, just uh, the report that Kevin had and here had met the uh, permanent secretary and other department officials on Tuesday. Uh, Kevin, do you want to just give members? I know you touched on it a few minutes ago, but do you want to just remind members of that discussion? Yeah, uh, Chair. Primarily, the meeting was to discuss. You remember the <coughs> permanent secretary uh, attended the committee last week and indicated he'd be having a subsequent meeting with committee officials to discuss how to proceed in the. Uh, facilitating the committee's request for information in subsequent phases of the inquiry. Uh, myself and my, uh, my colleague uh, met with the Permanent Secretary and other officials and <coughs> they have suggested establishing a green sort of a memorandum as it were on uh, how to take issues forward. So particularly in respect to phase two for example uh, they've identified a, a number of key, key reports. Now there are over 300 reports that committee could look at, but there are some key reports. What they've suggested, they will also provide uh, a, a paper uh, based on these reports, indicating what the issues were, uh, are, and what uh, what actions have been taken uh, in, in relation to those in respect of uh, governance, governance within the housing sector, in respect of contracts and the the, the monitoring of those contracts, etc. Uh, also, the issue of having sort of a central person within the, the, the department to. So control or oversee, uh, you know, the request for the, the committee to ensure that they're being somewhat more proactive. It's detailed in a, in a short paper, and I thought be, uh, we haven't had much time to look at that paper, but we could present it next week when the committee is reviewing its evidence. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
So the evidence is received to date in respect to phase one and agree uh, or amend uh, the, the way forward as suggested by uh, the Department of Committee officials in respect of that, the, sort of requesting and receiving information from the Department. That, that, that's really what the, that was the focus of the, of the, the meeting on uh, Tuesday, I believe it was. Okay, so members have another minute it's just to hopefully the, or trying to expedite the work of the inquiry. Okay, staying on uh, matters of raising then, obviously there's the whole issue around plant maintenance contracts and we referred very briefly to this in the closed session and on page three of your tabled items, for example, you'll have the, the current decision from the uh, department in relation to letting up uh, plant maintenance contracts. Um, you'll remember that at last week's meeting, uh, the officials advised that there is a meeting between contractors and the House Executive officials today. Uh, to discuss the final settlement and the dispute over alleged overpayments. So uh, that's uh, happening today, I believe, as we speak. Um, so uh, uh, in relation to that ongoing negotiations, I suppose just want to make it clear for the record that this committee does not seek any role in these negotiations around that issue. Uh, it doesn't want to or seek to influence the outcome, uh, nor do we as a committee uh, want to uh, seek to mediate in any way in this. We have no role in that whatsoever. But the committee does have uh, concerns and which have already been expressed about how the issue regarding the suggested overpayment arose, the approach adopted to address this and the role of the Housing Executive and the Department in all of this. And just need to point out that throughout the last probably eight, eight months since this arose, we've had the statement around the £18 million overpayment. Um, and in all of that time, we have not heard, for example, from the contractors. I know members have suggested uh, before this that we might want to hear from the contractors. But I suppose from where I'm sitting at the minute, I mean, we are advised that those discussions are on their way. Last week, we were advised that they're almost concluded. We're now told they're actually meeting today to resolve it. And hopefully that matter can be resolved satisfactorily and as, as appropriate. So I'm not sure what else we can do just at this moment in time. Um, I suppose we have to wait the outcome. I mean, I mean members have concern about how all this arose and how it was handled. But at the minute, um, I suppose we need to wait until the matter is concluded. I mean, is that the view of the committee? Yeah. And, and we, we sort of read, we don't need to take any further action as, as of today until we hear the outcome of this, perhaps. Yeah. Then we consider it further again. Well, only in so far, Chairman, is if it if it's resolved between the housing executive and the contractors, then obviously there's no issue <coughs> about the what money is owed, etc. I think that was one of the concerns that the contractors had. But I think it's it, it may be appropriate at some stage to hear from the contractors simply to, to get <coughs> there we have heard from the, the, the executive side of the story as to first of all how this figure of eighteen million pound arose and then it's now transpired it's a bit less certain than eighteen million pound. There's there's discussions with the contractors etc. But I do think that at some stage, even if the figure is resolved, just to fill in the picture as to what happened here, it would be useful to hear from the contractors. Um, I don't know how the rest of the members feel, but I, I, I think that all, otherwise, all we do is we see the housing executive see <coughs> the picture, and then we're told it's all happy and it's all been resolved. That's fine, but you know, um, it might be. I, th I think, in fact, I think it's important that we hear from the other side of the equation how all this arose and you know some of the events around it. But I must say I agree with that. I think if it is resolved, there's still lessons to be learned from the fallout. Yeah. Of how it was handled. I don't think we need to hear that. Well, I think this has been, from all sides, been an, an unholy saga for going on too long, and I think we are clearly lessons to be learned from it. But on the one hand, I mean, you know, wish good luck to all those involved in the process to get that matter resolved, because it, you know, it goes to the heart of a whole range of issues, not least the uh, ongoing. Uh, Allocation of contracts and so on, which we are all as individual MLAs even indeed concerned about in terms of our own, uh, you know, constituencies and constituent interests. Okay, so I mean, we'll we'll actually return that. But I mean, I need to, There's a couple of other things actually arising from all of this, and I just want to go through them. Um, one was the, uh, the the reply from uh, from the chair of the Housing Executive Donald, who listened to the committee's questions, which arose following. 
his last experience before the committee. We remember people, you know, members had asked uh, Donald Hulis around what information they may have had, um, and I think he told the committee he didn't have any. Um, now, I refer you to t table items, page five. I mean, all this really augurs for a briefing with the head executive and our department on these matters. A couple of matters. I mean, obviously we have, we have that letter on table eight on page five. A letter from the permanent secretary with regards to Mr. Hoonis's letter regarding the ongoing negotiations. And that's on table eight on page six. And there was the, uh, there's also the need then to take a decision on our approach to obtaining the draft Campbell Tech Health report. And if I take the last one first, just for the record. Uh, the committee discussed this in closed session. We took our legal advice, and we have uh, proceeded to uh, ask the speaker to issue a section 44 uh, notice on the Housing Act uh, with respect to the committee's getting access to the draft report. But I formally asked the committee to agree that. Okay, thank you. And we've also decided to write to the uh, Campbell Tick Hill, advising them accordingly. Members agreed also on that action? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, come back then to the issue of uh, the Donald Hoolis's evidence here to the committee, which, uh, as I said, if they refer to page five, then there, there are some differences in that. So, uh, in his written response to the committee, Mr. Hoolis appears to have acknowledged that he did, in fact, have papers regarding potential underpayments to contractors, uh, despite having stated at the meeting that he didn't. Uh, Mr. Hoodless has also acknowledged that he didn't follow uh, DFP guidance on single tender action when appointing Campbell Tickell, but gave a reason for this, which was urgency. Um, and I have a reference to the extract from Ansar. Um, I don't know why members have had a copy of that. I mean, I don't want to read it out necessarily, it's just a paragraph from Ansar, but. Uh, the last relevant part of this would be that in Hansard, uh, Donald Hood has preferred the reason, I'm now quoting, the reason that it was done on Friday the 7th of June, that is the Commission of the Report. Um, the reason that it was done on Friday the 7th of June was simply because the Minister was due to speak in the Assembly on the following Monday. Now, members will recall, I presume, the session that we had here with Donald Hood, and uh, that was the reason he offered it is on Hansard, but that it's not the same response that he gives us in his uh, written letter. So I suppose uh, in terms of a way forward, we have to deal with the issue of the single tender uh, action and also the, uh, the the advice offered by the chair that he didn't have any information, despite the fact that a, a number of members here across all the parties actually had uh, queried that with him. I think, Gregor, you had made the point you know, are we dealing with a report or a document, or is it yeah. use of a word that was yeah. been bandied about, really? But the net effect of the evidence given by Donald at that session was that he didn't have sight of anything, when that's the fact that he did, and he's acknowledged that in his correspondence. So I think the committee is duty bound to have uh, back again here to the committee to explain all that, and also in terms of the single action tender, because clearly that involved uh, Donald acknowledging and his his words that, that didn't follow guidelines, and that was signed off also by a welfare department secretary. And if it didn't follow guidelines, then both didn't follow guidelines, I presume. So we need to invite them back. Members have enough to invite them back to this committee to have a discussion about. We need to have an honest and frank discussion about this. I mean, there's also the issue of the value of the actual document that was produced as well, because it's my understanding that given the aim that was involved and the the nature of the sample that was chosen, but the document doesn't. It, it, had there been a dispute which was finished up in court, the document would have been useless because the sample was so small it would never have stood up. So we're paying <coughs> forty thousand quid for something that you know may, may be of little value anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think it would be worthwhile yes, bringing them back and talking about that. Okay, I mean, are members happy enough? We bring them back. Just I mean, if we any necessarily any <coughs> discussion on that, members happy enough? Okay, fair enough. Thank you for that. Okay, members. So, um, I draw your attention again, still on Hundred Horizon, page fifteen of your pack. 
committee has received an update on the Housing Agriculture Board of Double Basin uh, contracts. It's interesting to see, Chairman, that because uh, it is part of the the subject of this um, of, of uh, this inquiry we're having. But it's interesting to see it as a result of some of the issues that were raised. Um, when the minister was met about the double glazing, that we now have a contract which is saving the housing executive 21.5 per cent. So that actually has, was a good outcome of the discussions that there was with either the Glass and Glaziers Federation or Turkey Tons, whoever you want to say it was with. You're still holding to that? <laughs> Maybe purely coincidental, of course. Tell me. Could be, could be purely coincidental. It we could all, be. We could all be. certainly welcome that aspect. There was no question about that. Okay, so again, moving on then to uh, members having nothing to say. Uh, I just want to remind members that uh, we had agreed last week to write to the uh, study of the environment, responding to their request for an input in the inquiry. At last week's meeting, it was suggested that the committee should write to the study of the environment and request that in the inquiries. Terms of reference that includes the financial implications of wind energy on consumers and businesses and so on. Um, so we have a proposed you know, response yeah, memo right. in your uh, your packets on page 17. Yeah. Chairman, can I, can I just say something about it? Because I'm not so sure that it reflects <coughs> um, strongly enough the point which I wanted to make as to why the economics of wind energy ought to be um, part of the part about it, that it does fall within the remit of the DOE committee to look at the um, economic implications because that's now a, an integral part of looking at any planning or a policy or planning application. Just this bit, uh, it's a third paragraph really. We're, we're almost conceding on no evidence at all that there might be some benefit to consumers in wind energy. And, I mean, could I just point out that despite the optimistic view of the Deddy report, All right, sir. the government has now agreed sure. a strike price which will be the, the basis of a contract with anybody who supplies wind energy for the next 25 years. And that strike price is three times more than the price which is um, charged by those who generate electricity from gas. <coughs> and the other fact that we do know is that gas prices are not going up, gas prices are coming down. And indeed, that has not been a, just a short-term <coughs> thing. That is, that, that is a long-term trend with fracking, etc., and the, the, the um, liquid gas which America is now exporting around the world. And I, mean, I just think that um, that third paragraph uh, disguises what the concern that I raised and which I hope that this committee would share, i.e. that we are now moving towards producing 40% of our electricity and planning policy is assisting in this from the most expensive form of um, energy production at a time when this committee is concerned about 40% of the people in Northern Ireland being um, in fuel poverty. And I, mean, I, really, I, I think that the, the, the note ought to be emphasising that our concerns about, first of all, what the debt is already accepting, that there could be a, up to an £89 per year increase in fuel bills. And secondly, what all of the trends are showing, and that is that um, even the optimistic view that will maybe somehow or other fossil fuel, the cost of fossil fuel, um, production of electricity, um, will um, mean that it catches up on wind, wind energy when there's no evidence of that. Well, the only thing I can suggest, because what I don't want to do is to open up a discussion, because it's not on the agenda as a substantive item. We could open up a whole discussion around wind energy and the costs and all the rest of that. So that, and the fact I don't want. I don't know. I, I don't but think that's the appropriate here. All I'm saying is that the the thrust of the request which I made last week was to indicate that when we are looking at a planning policy for wind energy, the economic impacts ought to be considered, and from our point of view, 
it's the economic impact on consumers, so the detrimental economic impact well, on we'll consumers. We could remove paragraph 3, but I mean, members last week were content, and I personally would be content to look, ask them to put it in the terms of reference. That doesn't mean I agree one way or another with any of this. So, uh, it's like everything else. We don't want to have a debate here. We can't really have a debate here. Um, no, and that's right. I was just Sorry. going to say, rather than open up the debate, yeah. I don't think removing Part 3 does any violence either for or against. Um, the debate can be held at another time yeah. at the appropriate location. So we, are our members happy enough then with the draft memo in front of them with or without Paragraph 3? We can take it out or not. Are our members happy enough we're going to delete Paragraph 3? Okay. okay. Members agree. <coughs> Yeah, <coughs> Chairman, one other thing, uh, just from on the minutes, we had agreed, maybe just in, uh, having to the letter, we had agreed we'd write to the First and Deputy First Minister with the progress of the Welfare Reform Bill. Has that been done? There's no letter here. Yeah, we did. Yeah. following just up on that. Yeah. one point in the, the thing also, sorry, a separate issue. Go ahead, Ron. That's just the, 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 the also on the, uh, the table papers uh, the, at... It speaks about the, the setting up of the, the housing and protection status force. It's just a welcome something like that there because it's an issue not only that this we committee has dealt with. Uh, we're coming to that, Fran. Yeah, so you were yeah. number 15. Yeah, so thank you for that. Okay, so uh, that, that was done, Sammy. Uh, then just to advise uh, members here that the, uh, the committee was to have. Uh, a briefing schedule from the department on the 2015 to 16 budget in late January, early February. The executive is having further discussions on the budget. We we're led to believe around that time, so it will not be finalised until later than anticipated. Um, so the department is advised, therefore, that it will not be in a position to brief the committee uh, until March. The budget. Okay, members. Have you note that? That early March, chairman, or do they say? It's, it hasn't been that definitive. But, yeah. Chairman. Could just go back to see the letter on the double glazing. Can we get any information from the executive? They've now awarded the contracts. Can we get any information from them as to when those contracts are going to start and some details as to where and um, which areas are going to be um, done in which sequence? Well, I actually think we need to do well. First of all, we kind of I alluded to it early on in terms of. Hopefully these discussions will conclude today between the contractors and the housing executive and the contracts will be let with an advisor let for that. We're also told here last week very clearly that there will be no spend, no no uh, I don't have exact words, but there will be much spend. This year. This yes. year, right? Which means that's seven million pounds lost to this budget. Um, which is we all have agreed it's just disgraceful. Uh, no so guarantee that it'll come back in monitoring no, rounds next and, year. And you've made that point repeatedly, so I think it's it's imperative that we we do get the department here to actually bring people like fully up to speed on all that. Yeah, well, so we, we need to get them sort of in monitoring emergency because it just can't be acceptable that kind of, kind of money is lost. And again, it goes to the core discussions earlier on about less needing to be learned and all the rest of that, but people are still learning. Anyway, okay, so. Uh, so we'll bring the department along to talk about that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of the budget then, with, with no indication, we've just been advised by exactly March. Okay. Um, the issue was raised last week um, by the department around the issue of social housing and looking at, obviously we have a, a formal briefing schedule for the 20th of February, 27th of February. And the department were looking for some other type of, of engagement with the committee um, in advance of that, either by way of a workshop or an actual committee or an informal session or a closed session. So, um, and they wanted to discuss issues like rent control, paper regulation, preferable options for landlords, control of regional housing. Um, I mean, that's a heavy agenda, and I don't know how far it gone through this actually is. What views that the parties have? I mean, have the parties been engaged with the department and all the rest of it on this? Um, because clearly, what the department are saying, they would want to have this session, which would inform them before they go back to the department, if you like, um, or the executive. That's a hefty piece of work, and I, I'm not so sure that any members here would be fully mandated if you like to take part in such a workshop, so I, I'm reluctant, at this stage, personally speaking, um, to engage in that. I think we should have the formal briefing. I mean, we could bring the formal briefing forward, if needs be, um, from the department. 
if, that, if that's a help, helpful, meet them, meet them halfway on that. Our members happy enough, we'll be trying to reschedule that. Okay. Well, thank you. Moving on. All uh, right. Uh, the department has written, Fra, you have raised this a moment ago. Um, Inform the committee here that a housing repossessions uh, task force has been established. Uh, you will recall the stakeholder event on the issue of repossessions was held in June of last year, and the objective of the task force outlined in the housing strategy action plan is to engage with stakeholders and identify actions to mitigate the impact of repossessions and, where possible, prevent them occurring in the first place. The makeup of the task force and the objectives are detailed in the draft in terms of reference to page 12 of your uh, table items pack. Um, and, uh, the department has noted the task force would prefer a report no later than 30th of June. So the inaugural meeting of the group is to take place in mid February. Um, so, I mean, if anybody has any comments to make on that, Fry, you want to sure, do Just that, uh, obviously, uh, I welcome the, the, the formation <coughs> of this group. Uh, I think it's uh, well balanced. Uh, there are quite a lot of experts. And, um, uh, just the, the, the Take out of the likes of housing rights service that, that have championed uh, this cause for for quite a while, and uh, mediating and uh, negotiating at the courts on behalf of people, uh, but it's much wider than that. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, again, I think the stakeholders events, any information that came out of that, uh, to make sure that that's available to uh, the, the the group. But it's made buzz with some good discussions yeah. and uh, some good suggestions that came out of it. Okay, so I mean, our members happy enough, and first of all, to welcome the, this development and remind the, the members here, of course, that the committee jointly hosted a, a, a stakeholder event with the Housing Rights Service some time ago. It was a very useful event, very informative, actually. So we very much welcome this, and we we'll obviously uh, hope that the department can keep uh, the members informed as, as expeditious as they can do as progress evolves. Is that fair enough? We formally welcome it. Thank you very much, members. Moving on then, off matters arising to the next item on the agenda, which is item five on the agenda, which is the Fuel Poverty Thematic Action Groups and Departmental Briefing. I formally then welcome uh, Michael Scott, Clara Carson, and Eilish O'Neill to the committee. I know you've been sitting chasing the air and waiting three hour routine business. Okay, so, obviously, this is uh, an issue, and some of you have referred to it a couple of times in the last week or two. This has been an issue of which has been close to the heart of the committee. In fact, we did have a quite a significant initiative on it some time ago now, um, which was essentially engaged around the whole of fuel poverty and the various themes attached to that. So, um, without any further ado, then, Ellis and your colleagues, can I just invite Michelle to take your members through your report? Sure. Um, thanks very much, and thanks for the opportunity to, to come along this morning. Um, I'm going to start with um, some background, which is in 2011, the Fuel Poverty Strategy, uh, which was published in March of that year, had an action that the Department would develop and consolidate effective working arrangements across the statutory, voluntary and private sectors to make best use of existing capacity and to secure increased commitment of all partners to joint working through new and existing partnership mechanisms. So to this end, it was decided to amalgamate the Fuel Poverty Advisory Group and the Interdepartmental Group on Fuel Poverty. That group is chaired by Minister, and thus giving greater access, openness, discussion and a forum for exchanging information and ideas. Following, sorry, I'm my glasses on. My sight is uh, failing fast. <laughs> Following the publication of the Social Development Committee's report on fuel poverty in May 2012 and its recommendation on the thematic action group approach, the Department decided to divide the larger forum into a series of four subgroups, each one taking forward issues highlighted by the Committee and each tasked with the production of an action plan with targets and objectives. So in line with the objective in our fuel poverty strategy to consolidate and make best use of our partners, members of the larger forum were asked to look at the areas of work to be addressed by each of the groups to determine which of these was of most relevance to their area of knowledge and expertise to participate in the relevant subgroups and for each group then to nominate a chair. The groups then produced a terms of reference and action plans for the group and the chairs of each group report back on progress against those action plans to the larger field poverty group which is chaired by Minister. The four subgroups are Achieving Affordable Warmth which is chaired by Pat Austin from National Energy Action, 
Prevention, which is chaired by Michael Scott from Firmus Energy. Targeting, chaired by Claire Carson from Power NI. And on opportunities, synergies and risks group, which I chair. <coughs> the copies of the action plans with updates and the terms of reference have been included in the briefing that was provided to committee for today. At the committee meeting on the 3rd of October, you heard from Pat Austin from <coughs> National Energy Action, who's the chair of subgroup one. And in a few minutes, I will pass over to Michael and then to Claire, who will speak about their respective subgroups. However, I would like to take a few minutes to update you on the work of Group 4, the group which I chair. The real positives from this group include the knowledge base and the experience of the members, who include representatives from DEDE, the Housing Executive, the Utility Regulator, the Consumer Council, the University of Ulster and the DOE. It provides a forum for discussion, communication and information sharing. My group have actions in relation to the following. The scrutiny of the Green Deal. Our actions so far have included meetings and briefings with the Department of Energy and Climate Change, the exchange of information and reports with the Consumer Council and Consumer Focus, and the distribution of available information to members of the group to inform opinion and discussion on the potential application of a similar model for Northern Ireland. And this is particularly relevant at the moment, given the work that's underway with Strategic Investment Board as they look at the potential for a loan scheme for energy efficiency in Northern Ireland. We work with our colleagues in DEDI as they introduce the Energy Bill. And as part of the Energy Bill, there is a requirement for an energy company obligation. And this is a requirement under that piece of legislation. And this is something which my group have been and will continue to be involved in. We seek opportunities for European funding for fuel poverty initiatives. And though this has largely involved ongoing communication with the DOE desk officer in Brussels, who alerts us to any call for partners. We have looked at the identification of barriers to household switching to other energy providers and the Consumer Council re recently published a report and this has provided valuable information on this area. We also are obliged to consider the take up of gas and here as well as the ongoing conversations within the group, the utility regulator has indicated that this research can be included in their forward, their forward work programme. A significant piece of work, potential piece of work for us will also be to monitor the impact of welfare reform on rates of fuel poverty. However, as the groups have now been in place for 18 or 19 months, the department has begun a review of the effectiveness of the present structure. All members of all of the groups have been consulted and a report is being prepared which will recommend that the four groups now amalgamate and go down to two groups as there has been duplication of work has been identified in some areas. Fuel poverty, as you know, is impacted by three factors, the income of the household, the cost of energy and the energy efficiency of the home. And we in DSD have legislative priorities <coughs> for only one of these factors, which is domestic energy efficiency. Much work is ongoing within Housing Division as we look at targeting of resources and the introduction of a new warm home scheme. And just by way of illustration of the work that is ongoing within the department since the committee produced its report in 2012, we've reviewed the fuel poverty definition and produced a severity index, which has identified those households who are suffering the worst effects of fuel poverty. We've worked with the University of Ulster and OFM DFM to produce a GIS mapping tool to find those homes. And we are currently working with all 26 councils across Northern Ireland in piloting an area-based approach to deliver energy efficiency measures to those homes. We've introduced the boiler replacement scheme and we have conducted detailed assessments of both the pay as you go for oil proposal and the Green New Deal proposal. <coughs> the work of the cross-departmental fuel poverty group and the four subgroups complement the work of the department as we take forward the actions from the fuel poverty strategy. So I'm now going to pass over to really Michael. Okay. Uh, good morning everyone. My name is Michael Scott, I chair of the uh, prevention subgroup. Um, just to reiterate what, what Elias has said, you know, we've found benefit in the groups themselves and being, there being subgroups, just as a mechanism for communication, um, sharing ideas, different members from different organisations, be they from energy providers, uh, the departments uh, and other agencies, to come together to formulate ideas and thinking about how to address and prevent measures around <coughs> poverty. So we have found it a constructive um, exercise to be to be part of. The group was charged with, and, and as Elisa said, has, has developed a, a, an action plan. The membership is quite diverse. So we have membership from DSD, from the Utility Regulator's Office, from NEA, the Field Poverty Charity, 
and myself from Firmus Energy, a, a gas and distribution uh, business. Priorities areas that we have really been looking at, and we're trying to condense um, some of those areas through the discussions that we have had over the number of months, and we've really focused on three key areas. Um, essentially, the three that we have landed on really looking at and considering in further detail have been the one-stop shop approach to the Northern Ireland <coughs> NI Direct website. Essentially, there's the NI Direct website is in situ, but there's a lot of different agencies doing a lot of the good work with a lot of good measures in place, but it's where is the, the focus point for everybody in society to go to one key uh, position and to know mm -hmm. what measures are in place and who provides what aid and grant assistance to those in fuel poverty. And we'd like to take that one forward and consider that measure forward through the NI Direct website. We also looked at budgeting for, for oil, the prepayment option uh, around oil, and improved energy efficiency. And it's just through shared ideas between Power NI, ourselves, NEA. We're coming together to say, can we actually do more with the schemes that we already have in place? So one of the positives that we would have seen out of that, that being in ourselves with um, Firmus Energy, would be the oil boiler or the boiler replacement scheme, where there's a thousand pound of uh, grant assistance, but we would also add in three hundred pound of assistance to that to just give it a, an additional help to those in need around the boil oil boiler replacement scheme. Um, We'd agree with Ailish, the group. We'd agree with Ailish just on maybe consolidating some of the number of the, the subgroups and maybe more of a target approach and look to identify a key area to really take forward in the next the next phase. A recommendation or our view would probably be a recommendation really for the, the one stop shop approach and targeting activities through the NI Direct website. Okay. Pass you over to Claire. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Claire Carson from Power NI, and I'm the chair of the targeting subgroup. And I'm just going to take you through three main action areas that we focused on, um, and what has been done and worked well to date, and a few improvements or recommendations for going forward. Um, our group, as I said, focused on targeting and included members from DSD, NEA, DARD, and the Consumer Council. And our group provided a brilliant forum for us for sharing information and inputting into the targeting approach. So one of our first actions was to take a review of the area-based approach that Ailish had just mentioned, which you're familiar <coughs> with. And overall, our group is very supportive of the pilot. Um, we provided input into recommendations for improvement, so everything from the original survey um, that was issued right through to the measures that were installed in people's properties. Um, and we feel as a group that the targeting pilots worked well, and the subgroup was kept well informed by DSD. The group is certainly supportive of this approach being rolled out, and we'd be keen to see how it could be implemented or incorporated into any future grant programmes going forward, whilst bearing in mind as well that there needs to be scope for vulnerable customers who possibly fall outside of those targeted areas. We commend DSD and this committee for undertaking this pilot. Um, our second action area was a review of other targeted approaches. So as a group, we met with the Maximising Access to Rural Are Areas programme, MARA, in the west of the province. Um, just to gain an understanding of how they approach their targeting and how they roll that pilot out across 13 different zones. We find the information extremely useful and it identified key learnings for any future targeting approaches um, from everything from a project management structure to the benefit of having an appointed lead organisation to take the project forward. We also focused on funding. And as a subgroup, we were well aware of the energy saving schemes that were available, with some of us even involved in the delivery of those energy saving schemes. Um, everything from warm homes, boiler replacement, through to the range of NICEP schemes available. Um, and similar to the point that Michael had raised, our group recognised the need for this joined up approach to all of these funding streams. We need to make it easier for those customers most in need to be able to avail of the range of schemes that are out there. And it's key that any scheme administrator taking forward this approach refers a customer to the best scheme. So, for example, with Power and I's energy saving schemes, if a customer comes through to us for a measure, we always ensure that it is the best scheme for them and always check in the first instance if they don't qualify for warm homes and if they do direct them to that scheme that's most appropriate for them. Our final thoughts were that as a group we find all the activity very positive and a useful forum for us for sharing information and certainly the main focus was on energy efficiency but it's also important for us to realise that energy efficiency is only one aspect of fuel poverty and low income is also a driver of that. 
So while the energy efficiency work is positive, it can't on its own provide a total solution. So we'd be certainly supportive of continuing to work with DSD going forward and see if there is a scope for a more joined up approach as the pilot develops further. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, just a couple of points we're bringing all the members in, just to kind of remind ourselves, because obviously the committee uh, hosted some time ago, as you know, the stakeholders event, which everyone thought was quite uh, helpful, and it really brought together, I think, a big many odd stakeholders, certainly a, a, a sizable number across all of the departments and, and <coughs> just to make your own. Um, and that was all very helpful. And, and obviously, the, the, the committee then adopted a <coughs> thematic approach to that, and that coincided with the department's own view of it. And whether we are agreed or not around the specifics of each thematic group, it didn't really matter. The, the focus of this committee was <coughs> we need to have a joined up approach to tackling the problems, and in fact, even teasing out sometimes competing arguments because some of the key stakeholders might have been saying you need to do A, and some <coughs> were saying, well, actually. That wouldn't help or whatever. So what we wanted to do was, through the thematic approach and the task groups that the working groups today would actually then just literally work their way through all of those what may be barriers or may be good initiatives. Uh, and we know there there are a number of both. So in my simple mind, I'd like to see somewhere like a, is there a table which actually says, yeah, we identified that issue. We all agreed a good idea and we're moving ahead on that. So that's ticked. And you know we had an issue identified. Don't agree that that's you know the point you're making. So in a way in which you end up with a report that says here are the things which are working and need to be then taken forward. And actually then who then does need to take that forward. So and the second <coughs> part, so just looking a wee bit of a, a view of the process of that. And just to have to say that the last one of the last sessions we had, Pat Austin, as a chair of the one of the groups, expressed some dissatisfaction around the structure and the support and so on and the effectiveness of the working group. But what I'm being <coughs> warned is, and not, I'm not saying the opposite, but certainly a positive view, which is fine. So have you any comment to make on parts without personalising it? But I mean, she did say there were resource issues and so on and so forth. So, ladies. The work that we're doing and looking at the groups, Chair, will involve um, pulling together the work that all four subgroups carried out putting that into a report and then looking at the actions that need to be carried forward. And when that piece of work um, has been completed, then obviously we provide that briefing to yourselves so that you can have a look at it. Um, all of the minutes were, were minuted, so there will be an, an accurate um, uh, record of the conversations which, which took place. Um, we also propose that we that we chair. I think what we tried to do when we established these thematic groups was to um, was to involve people um, such as energy providers and energy lobby groups and, and give them some ownership and some responsibilities by asking them to be chairs of the groups and then drive forward the work of some of the groups. But I think then everybody sort of realised um, at some point in time that uh, the department, um, as the responsible department for domestic energy efficiency, were largely best placed to drive a lot of the actions through. So that would mean that we would take over um, when the, there's been a realignment. We would take over the chair of the two groups, but still maintain the members that <coughs> we have. Because you could see, as, as each of us were sort of reading out the list of, of attendees, there's, there's duplication, and those departments tend to have a limited number of people they can send. They can send along, albeit they're very valuable to have around the table. Um, I think, um, without personalising uh, the, the Chair of Subgroup 1 um, uh, comments, I think that maybe there was a feeling that there were actions that needed to be taken forward by the department, which which you know an individual or a member of a lobby group couldn't really take forward, and that may have been the basis for it. I, I'm not I'm not really sure. What we were trying to do was divide responsibility, and, and if that hasn't worked in a particular case, then then we look at that. It's just in terms of, for me, you see, in terms of the progress of this and the evolution of it, uh, I'm, I'm still struck with the comments from Linda McCauley from the BBC uh, Radio. And when she attended our stakeholders event and, and fairness to her and the BBC, they give that fair wee bit of positive coverage. But she did say to me at the end of an interview, that's all very well, but what will you be able to tell us in six months or a year that you've done? So, I mean, I'm just struck by that because I'm waiting on a microphone coming from Linda McCauley some of these weeks to, to say, what's happening with this field poverty business? It's getting worse, or it's whatever. It you know the meaning of the point I'm making? So yeah, if it yeah. wasn't going to happen, it'll happen now. For, for, for us, we have to. Uh, I'm just reminding her that I was. Her phone listening. number. <laughs> just reminding her that I was listening intently to what she was telling me. Um, I, so I think, I think probably from the, from the scale that we mentioned earlier on about the 40% of people in field poverty, just the scale of the problem, it can be frustrating to see progress and see what we're doing. Because 
If there's three levers around fuel poverty, as one seems to be sorted or getting better, there seems to be another pull by another lever and was dipped down further into fuel poverty. But I think, as we've been saying, across the different chairs, um, right across the four chairs, it's only by working together and continuing to work and come up with solutions and trying to deliver against solutions will it actually get better. Yep. So I think that's what we're just aiving to deliver against. Okay. Um, not to get rid of Michael, that's the That's, that's point. the thing, but we've got we to gotta do more. I think that the, the utility regulator, when she took up her post quite recently, said high energy costs are, are here to stay. I mean, what we do, and what we have the money, the investment there has been from, from government to, in, to install energy efficiency measures in properties across Northern Ireland, then when there's a hike in energy costs, that work is, is negated to a large extent. So what we're trying to do is make sure that homes, the most vulnerable homes, are as energy efficient as they can be. And uh, the factors around energy costs then do continue to cause great concern to, to all of us. And the point that you made around wind farms and the increased energy costs, I mean, every year when the warm home discount payment is made, we receive letters from pensioners and from people who live here asking why they don't get the payment. And we refer them on to Daddy because it's appropriate that Daddy answer those queries. But we have within our subgroup asked Power and I and Daddy to look at if we were to make a similar payment as to the Warm Homes discount payment here. But that would increase everybody's energy bills in Northern Ireland by, I think it was £38, or was the figure? Yes, around so about £38. Rough pounds, needs to be which can be a tipping though. point you know, for, for a number of people to put them in. So the 42% becomes you know, 46% because you, you've increased this. So those are our, our serious concerns. OK, I have uh, Maggie, Trevor and Stuart. Thanks very much. The presentation is a point that's been raised before in terms of target because while the boiler replacement scheme is a good scheme, warm home is a good scheme, it's not always the most vulnerable people who need it that are targeted because of the costs involved. And again, it's something I've raised before the additional cost, for instance, with building control, be £72, pound, £86, pound, I think, depends on the particular circumstance. But they are good schemes, warm homes is the same. but. That don't always reach the people who most need it. And because of low income <coughs> is one of the, the, the driving factors in fuel poverty, because if you're in poverty, you're in poverty, and if you're in fuel poverty in most cases, um, that is part of the difficulty. And it is that joined up approach. And actually, the, particularly the department and the other groups involved see the most vulnerable groups that are affected and then transfer attention to ensuring that those people get. That those that the schemes apply to them, because you could get somebody in a position who may qualify for boiler replacement, but because they don't get the the full grant, then they're left in a position of maybe two or three hundred, and it is about tipping points. It may seem a small amount of money to some people, but to other people, even that thirty-eight or forty pound or a couple of hundred pound is the tipping point, and they simply can't access the scheme. Yeah. That's important, but that's realised. I think. So, so, so that's probably one of the things that we've been doing with with the thousand pound with the with the boiler replacement scheme. They add three hundred pounds yeah, well of our own money that'll come back. It's it's a regulatory allowance. Um, it'll come back over the lifetime of, of the thirty year license that the firmus Energy has. But it's just to add that little bit more to get the tipping point, so as there's less of a contribution from the household. And so make such a it's measures like that. And talking with the the, the utility regulator and. In the, in the forum and DSD and Daddy and formulating some ideas, just some deliverables, some tangible coming out the other side that I think we need to just build upon. Yes. Work. Certainly in the range of energy efficiency schemes that we run um, through Power and I, um, we work with a network of referral partners right across Northern Ireland um, to try and find those people who are maybe more isolated, who are out in the ground, you know, would know those people in their local area that need to come forward to benefit from like a free heating scheme. So we try and work as hard as we can with the local people on the ground to find those people. Okay. Our, our pilot, which um, is using the, the GIS mapping tool, which the first phase of the pilot, as you know, was completed and we briefed you on that, and it, it, it has been evaluated and has been proven that we are finding the homes where people are on the lowest income and they have the, the, um, the most need of the energy efficiency measures. The, the next stage of that is testing how when councils go into using the maps, go in and knock on doors and encourage people because you know you'd be amazed at the number of people oh, who need the measures, who are eligible the for the measures and who say no. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and it's really frustrating and, and there's there's also issues around benefit take up in terms of pension credit because it's older people but obviously are not taking that up. But if and when transforming your care is rolled out, 
where the whole ethos is to keep people in the community, it becomes even more important. But if older people particularly, and statistically our elderly population would have doubled by 2020, uh, that's what we're told anyhow, and it becomes more urgent within the next relatively short few years that all of that is dealt with. Yeah, it does. We're hoping that this new model where the councils will will be very proactive in encouraging people to take up the measures. The next stage of the pilot then is where we're looking at how we can deliver those measures. Mm -hmm. And we're trying a different delivery approach where we're using local installers and opening it up to, to local installers as opposed to having one or two large contracts. And that's what's being tested at the minute. And we hope to be coming to you soon with uh, a consultation <coughs> document just before we go out to public uh, consultation on that proposal. Yes, thank you, Trevor. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks, Chairman. I think at least I certainly stole my thunder in this one because when it's making, I mean, I take the point that some people are difficult to reach or we don't reach everyone that should reach. We're reaching a lot of people who don't actually want the service that they're going to be provided. So, and I think that's a difficult balance act in terms of you may have 40% of people in fuel poverty. Some people, will, even those who are in fuel poverty, don't want to help themselves whenever the help's there. That's one of the points. The, the, the other one, and, and I get a bit precious about this one, you name some groups, and I mean, and I'm in politics since 2005, some of these groups are hardly known to me and are represented in the area. So how are, how are those people who are hard to reach going to know about the likes of Mara? I mean, I've I only known Mara this last, well, maybe this last 12 months, where they've come to us for some information in terms of constituency problems. But I think sometimes we put too much focus on, the, on those. I think councils are probably better charged with their own. And, and I know I was a former member of Huntington Council and we had two two girls who are very dedicated and were on the doors regularly in socially deprived areas. And I think, Michael, you would probably yes. relate to that in terms of yeah. the work that's done with Anandram. So, so I, I think sometimes the money spent in the wrong areas and the wrong people doing the job to try and get these people encouraged to bring them out of fuel poverty. Because, I mean, I, have, I had a case this week where uh, housing staff want to put gas in someone's house. They don't want it. But I don't want this gas. I think there's a suspicion of gas as well, of course. Yeah. But the, the fact is, the moment the, the people like that are in poverty, but they don't want to help themselves to get out of poverty. So, so I think there's an education, and I, I think the department should be looking at who is actually taking lead some of these rules. And I think councils are better charged in terms of the local knowledge of the local area. And, and I mean, I think maybe a piece of work from DSD should be to actually look at what councils are doing better jobs as opposed to others and trying to find out where the good practice is. I think as part of our pilot, the working with councils has worked really, really, really well. What we hope the new model would look like is that there is a, a proportion of funding which goes to councils to allow them to, to go out on the ground, to use the maps, to go into the areas. They may have to go back. I mean, one of, one of my team spent a day with the council who were <coughs> in this phase of the pilot who were knocking on doors and, and the, the council official had been at this property three times because it was a very elderly lady mm -hmm. who needed a lot of measures done to her house but he, he kept going back it becomes a, a there's a call in as to at what stage are you badgering an individual but he was really just trying to encourage her and he brought a member of my team with him and she was so impressed with the, the time and effort that the council official spent in encouraging this lady who did eventually then say okay and really what was putting her off was the thought of the upheaval to her home. Mm -hmm. you know, she, she just <coughs> didn't like the thought of people that she didn't know coming in and out of her property was she going to have to leave her home and how much upheaval was there going to be clearing out her roof space or sort of small things that can, that can prevent people from taking up the measures so what we want to do and it'll be a fine line between you know how much do we pay for the administration of a scheme which encourage fines people and encourages people and how much is spent on measures so that's that's the, the issue that we're teasing out at the minute it would be one of the areas that in in, in the own development of the gas network outside of outside of belfast whenever we first firmest energy first brought uh, natural gas to Derry, the strathfoyle was the first housing estate in Derry, and there there was quite a lot of reticence about getting connected to the natural gas and we had quite a lot of work to do uh, in the Strathfoyle area. But that has really turned around now and there was some great work done by, by local representatives as well, just giving some encouragement to the local residents as well. But it's taken time, that was eight years ago, um, and it's just one of those things that's an ongoing as we go into new areas. Mm. That people will still be have some of that reticence. It may be dwindling, but I still think there needs to be more work done. But, but, but I think that's the point I'm trying to make. I think in terms of who are facing the public, because I mean, by the very nature of the, the elderly population, they're suspicious anyway. So, but I think there needs to be familiarity with the people who are on the doors. 
to try and encourage them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, without harping on about the Antrim model, I mean, there's two girls in that team, very dedicated and very precious about what they've done. They've got into homes and they have converted people. But if you have the wrong people engaged in the process, mm -hmm. So, so I think an awful lot of thought needs to go into who that is. But, but then there is money spent on other organisations like Mara. And to be honest, I really personally, that's my own belief, I don't really see an awful, an awful lot of work in them. Well, uh, Mara is a DARD. It's a DARD initiative which we are involved in. We, in my department, we sit on the, the project group because mm. one of the um, advice services they were providing was around field poverty and the availability of different schemes. So um, it, it wouldn't have been something um, that I would have a great, a great deal of knowledge of, although um, some other of my colleagues do, do attend mm. the Mara project. project. Uh, uh, Stuart? Yeah, um, thank you. I mean, I, overall, I, I appreciate what you're doing to sort of renew and refresh yourselves and to make sure you're focused and targeted in reducing the group size. It makes good sense. But it, it's back to what actually happens on the ground and how things are delivered. I mean, for example, you've said that as an action in uh, the <coughs> poverty prevention action plan, that within one year you would engage the home heating oil sector to look at alternatives to high-priced drums of oil. Well, my experience on the ground is you must have completely and utterly failed in that because you can't turn to any local shop in East Antrim, but you find drums of oil stacked up outside. You now have petrol stations selling it. I saw a, a man last night struggle to fill two drums in a local petrol station and hunk, hike them into the back of his car. I mean, that's, that, that is, it, 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 I mean, what, what was the engagement? Because clearly it's failed and you haven't done it within a year. Because just drums of oil are everywhere. That, 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 that's, that's point one. And the oil, continuing on the oil theme, um, the, the whole, the cost of oil, and we've seen recently a court case where uh, oil fraud is now um, an issue because of the high price of, of domestic fuel oil, not delivering a few litres, um, you know, selling somebody short, and in a particular case it was in the press recently, it was quite a few hundred litres were being sold short. Uh, and that was a, com a commercial user. But the domestic, how, how, how can the domestic user be assured that they're actually getting what they're buying? Uh, and what, again, it goes back into what action is there into delivering less than, for example, I think the minimum for most people is five. Some deliverers are offering three. Uh, but can you, for example, do the, the, the a smaller amounts? Again, uh, the whole encouragement into community buying schemes, um, driving down the price. There are amazingly good um, schemes out there, but um, again, just one example in, the con in my constituency, where a very active organiser of it has decided that for various reasons he can't be, be, be the organiser any longer. <coughs> He's fallen. There was nobody else to take it on. I mean, he was operating a spreadsheet. He was keeping records of, of, of all the people in the community that wanted to, to buy oil. He and his wife were doing the ring around among the local merchants to, to, to drive down the price and all of that. Because they because they aren't in a position to do that any longer, the scheme isn't happening, mm -hmm. uh, w which is very frustrating. And then final point in relation to... Um, well, in relation to the councils, the councils have done a very good job in, in, in encouraging a whole range of things, but is there an appreciation that now going into transition and into new local authorities, there's, while, while the responsibility and the remit may be there, there is going to be, inevitably there's going to be a gap because the reorganisation of who's going to be doing what, what priorities councils give to various functions and just simply massive amount of, of change and, and staff turnover. We're not moving it. We're moving into an unstable period rather than a stable period to encourage councils to do anything. And then finally, the frustration of communities where gas pipelines pass them by and they can't get into them. It's not a firm issue. It's actually a Phoenix issue. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to deal with it. But <laughs> speak about that. But it's, it's, it just seems yep. to be the, 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 the complexities and the, 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 the over-bureaucratic rules and regulations of why when a gas pipeline passes a, a substantial number of houses and homes that for all the bureaucracy, a, a community which would incredibly benefit from from uh, domestic gas can't have it. Shall I take that one first? Shall I take you that take one? It, I'll, yeah. I'll take that one first. If, if, it's, <coughs> if it's not in uh, the Firmus Energy it's not. licensed area, it's fine. But I'll just explain what outside of Greater Belfast, so the stretch of the pipeline from Antrim out to mm. Londonderry, coming from Antrim again down to Newry and Moran Point. Um, 
We'll target areas, large industrial commercial customers, anchor loads, essentially to draw the gas in those areas, um, go into work closely with the housing executive and housing associations where there's new builds housing. Um, also work with the housing developers and looking at it with housing associations the likes of I was in Best Buy <coughs> long ago in Uri, which was a, a new area opened up to natural gas that hadn't had it um, beforehand. But there are I suppose what is what I do say to people in, in our own uh, license area, we spend about ten million pounds on, on capital spend each year spend about five million pounds in operational spend. There's a limit to the bucket of money that we have available and it's about targeting the, the various areas. Now we have been through a, a price control, a distribution, a pipeline price, price control with the, the utility regulator and there are incentive mechanisms in there going forward and we're looking at those. Um, <coughs> it was just released just before Christmas um, to incentivise operators to look at infilling into other areas where they wouldn't have traditionally been or were the areas where we traditionally wouldn't have been that that would be incentivized to go into those areas and, and grow the number of the customer numbers. But our customer numbers are growing considerably. Our our original business plan was to do it at about two thousand connections a year. We're currently at a run rate of about forty three hundred um, connections a year, so it is encouraging, but there is a lot of demand given the differential of uh, gas prices and oil prices at the moment. We're confident and we're hopeful that it'll be continue to grow and go into the areas that you're mentioning there, Stuart. Sorry, if I could cover it. The, the Oil Federation, um, just for, for information, do uh, attend the larger fuel poverty group, so there is representative there. The issue of oil drums and the price that's charged for oil drums, we raised with um, trading standards to try to see if there was anything that could be done to, to monitor the price that's charged. Oil isn't regulated uh, and we were told there wasn't really anything that could be done. Um, we carried out a piece of research within the department to look at the price that's charged for, for oil drums right across Northern Ireland. We found there were some places where you could get a drum of oil and it could be delivered for the same price per litre as, as a delivery of five or 900 litres. Um, and those, because of competition in the area, do seem to be growing. It's not ideal. Some of the concerns we had were about <coughs> safety and if you were an elderly person, yeah. you know, how on earth did you get this oil into your to tank? tank? Um, so we did this, this piece of work and we did um, identify that there were places where you could go and get oil for the same price as a delivery. Not ideal. But, and there were some places where extortionate prices were, were being charged and, and people are using them. That's why the pay as you go for oil proposal that was made to the department, we were so keen to look at this and to see if there was a way we could help people to budget for oil. There are many oil stamp saving schemes. When we speak to the Oil Federation, they'll tell us that people can now pay for their oil through um, a direct debit. They can do oil stamps. They can use PayPal, that there are different mechanisms whereby people can help to budget for oil. And um, we looked at the pay as you go for oil and I think we have reported um, back that the, the business case which was made, while this was a really good idea and we saw it operating pilot, there were very large costs associated with it and there was going to be an additional price per litre of oil to the person who was using the facility. So in one way to have the technology to help people budget was a good thing but then they were going to have to pay extra money per litre of oil to help <coughs> the facility there to help them to budget and when it went to our economist it, it, it unfortunately didn't stack up. You asked then about councils. Our conversations with councils have been, our, our timing isn't great in this, but our timing isn't great because the existing contract ends in June of this year. Okay. So we have to move to a new model and what we don't want to do is just just because there may be some difficulties with, with the reorganisations of councils, not develop something which we think has <coughs> the potential to be a really good scheme going forward. Uh, now, there are, some of the councils have said mm, the timing's not great, um, but we're happy to work within the plan. <coughs> The majority, the vast majority of councils are, are very are very keen to, to take this forward. They see this as, as a, a really good service to deliver for the people who live in their in their boroughs. So well, there may have been one or two who have said <coughs> a bit worried about the time and we're getting all of this other work, um, the vast majority are are very keen to go forward. Okay, Sammy. Yeah. Let me just pick up <coughs> the council one first of all, because I think it's right. I know that Lauren Council now um, actually for some of the administration for the kind of bulk buying schemes will actually pay groups, you know, for it's only a small amount of money, but very often it, it does enable them to get a computer where they can um, uh, keep records and, and uh, that kind of thing. It all has to be done on a voluntary basis. And I just w I wanted to explore that. 
it's not it's patchy across council, <coughs> but with reorganisation of councils, is there a, a, a chance now to talk to councils to see if this can be integrated into um, their work for the future? Because I think many of them will be looking for a bigger role anyway. And you see, for the the, the pay. Um, as you, as you consume type scheme, is there any role there that councils could pe play? And I mean, because sometimes they might even have um, contact with some uh, local groups who are already buying in bulk anyway. Um, tying that in, to, um, would that cut down the administrative cost? Of it? I don't, I, I don't know how it becomes so expensive administratively like, um, that it becomes prohibitive. But that would be one way if. You know, if councils actually were encouraged, look, look at a strategy, whether it's supporting groups that um, organise bulk buying or um, helping those groups, because they'll have the contact to encourage people to use pay, uh, you know, some pay-as-you-use scheme which can be administered, um, or fuel stamp scheme or whatever else which can be administered by the council. You know, is, is that a possibility? Um, and might some of your energies be towards that? The other question, um, Michael, I really wanted to ask you about this one. I, I get told by um, you know, Phoenix, for example, that the utility regulator is the one who stands in the way of, extend, of expanding the, 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 the pipeline <coughs> because he, he only allows so much um, you know, to, to be put on as far as additional capital is concerned. But there are still places where licences <coughs> exist and pipelines <coughs> haven't been extended. Now, I can understand you don't put a pipeline in if you don't have demand, but I can think of one place in my own constituency where the stock answer is there are not enough people. When I ask what has been done to try and generate customers, it hadn't been for um, the local community association and our own councillors going round doors saying to people, do you realise that if you register there's a possibility we could have gas as an alternative to oil or electricity here? <coughs> um, that wasn't being done by the people who you would have thought would have had some um, market incentive to do so. I mean, is there more that can be done by energy companies where there are gaps and where there, they do have the permission to extend the pipeline to actually try and recruit customers? Um, I would say our licence is referred to as a 10 towns licence, the, the Firmus Energy licence, although it's, it's towns and cities, and there's more than 10 towns and cities now. And what we have done over the last number of years is to look at areas, say, uh, in the vicinity of the, the south-north transmission pipeline or the north-west transmission pipeline, to look and see are there other areas where we could where we could go to. And there's a misinformation sometimes that's put around that, that Firmus Energy aren't interested in doing connecting domestic customers, which we are because, like I say, we're we're now connecting 4,000 domestic customers um, each year. But we have, over the last number of years, extended our gas network into new areas, into areas that weren't either in our licence award area or that weren't in the vicinity of the pipeline, but we have built the pipeline out to those. So there's areas like um, Port Stewart. There was Warren Point where we had a, a pipeline as far as Newry, but we went out as far as Warren Point to connect the likes of Seca Packaging. Um, I mentioned Bestbrook before, where we're coming off um, the Newry pipeline to go into an area that was there was a concentration of housing association, um, and it wasn't in our licence area. But we worked with the utility regulator in that regard, and we turned that one around. Actually, Mickey did a lot of work with us on that, on that one. Um, so we have done a number of those extensions, and we hope to do a number more. You know, it's only by building more gas network will we continue to connect more customers and grow our business. And as we extend the network, that'll make the network <coughs> more and gas more available to other households. And the, the feasibility and the, the economics of connecting more um, household will stack up better in that situation. So we. We have seen a positive relationship <coughs> with the utility regulator in granting approvals to ourselves, which we had welcomed. Okay, uh, there you go. I think it's the last. Uh, thanks, Chair. And 
Uh, forgive me if I sound cynical to a degree. I'm not naturally cynical, but I'm becoming increasingly so. And I want to predicate what I'm about to say against a <coughs> conversation that took place in my constituency office last Saturday morning when I, a woman who had been in my class at school up until about the age of 14 arrived. And she told me that her partner of 26 years had died during the course of last winter, former policeman, former prison officer. The cause of death was hypothermia, with no other underlying conditions. He died of the cold. The day he died, I happened by chance to be in a, another property um, on a Saturday morning. And in that property was a young person who had an entitlement to job seekers allowance of just over £50 a week, which is fine. According to the government, you can live in £50 a week. The problem was she had been sanctioned. Here she had been sanctioned for over six months of the previous year. So consequently, the £50 a week went down to £25 a week. The third floor flat, which was modern, which conformed to all the insulation properties and everything else, uh, had no gas because admittance hadn't been gained to check the carbon monoxide and the gas was disconnected. No electricity because there was no money for electricity and ice on the inside of the windows. That individual was, honestly, as true as I'm sitting here, making toast for a candle. My point is, she was not helped out of fuel poverty by any action of any government. Mm -hmm. Here she went mm -hmm. into fuel poverty as a consequence of the actions of other departments in government. <coughs> My point is, if someone is sanctioned for not attending whatever, is there a method by which that person is put towards somewhere that will at least keep them keep them warm? Because to identify people in fuel poverty is not that difficult. If you knock every other door in four wards of my constituency, you will find someone who is in fuel poverty. And no matter what we do, no matter what we spend, any variation in the wholesale retail price of fuel mitigates it. So we've got to look long term. But the short term thing is to stop the people who are most at risk of dying because of this. Um, from dying. I, I'm also quite concerned that there may be a further threat in the future due to some carry on to do with an in interconnector where the cost of that may well actually end up being passed on to consumer. I can't remember, for, forgive me, the exact details of it, but I do understand that there is a, an interconnector of some description that is going to require a substantial amount of money built on it in the States of the country overseas it as such that the cost of doing that will be passed on to the retail customers. And lastly, and forgive me for this, I'm not quite sure that monitoring the impact of welfare reform on fuel poverty is actually what we should be doing. I think we should be trying to predict it and to take whatever steps will actually mitigate it. Um, the, the case that I referred to earlier of the young person on 20, or well, essentially 25 pounds a week, the truth was there was an honest entitlement dating back over seven years there to almost 400 pounds a week. But nobody ever thought to ask the question or guided that person. They simply siloed it. Dale steps to work, can't attend steps to work. Why can you not attend underlying issues? And it was all it was all there. All somebody had to do was read, and that honestly is not an isolated case. Sorry, Chair. That's all that's obviously not. No, no, but it's no, yeah, random. Apologies, and and apologies it's, cut off. It's a tragic effort. situation. Yeah, it's it's tragic. Tragic. yeah, but it's not unique. That's no, no, absolutely. It was occasioned by the actions of one wing of government mm. that is actually mm. running contrary to a to a stated programme for government aim of reducing uh, fuel poverty. There's there's a there's an initiative we're just finalising now at the moment with uh, the likes of Bryson Energy. We are going out to, to more vulnerable households. Those vulnerable households are identified as those those people who are registered on our firmest car and older persons register. And we're going out to those households to help with energy efficiency <coughs> um, advice and assistant, physical assistance in the house. Because whenever you say to somebody, turn down your boiler or turn up your boiler or whenever the clocks change, it's not necessarily as easy as uh, understanding where your gas meter is and where your gas boiler is and how you do it and what's the. So we're just in finalising engaging with um, Rice and Energy, who will go out and contact those customers on our firmest car register to go out and physically do that. 
and also to do a benefit entitlements check. And we were talking with Dalish and DSD about how, as the committees and the groups, we could share the learnings that we have of doing those type of exercises to roll that further afield so we can do the piece with our own customers mm -hmm. uh, in our own network area. Well, it's how we do things like that and, and do some practical, physical assistance in the home for vulnerable customers. Okay, Michael. I mean, obviously, you've okay. drawn attention to a couple of uh, severe cases, and that must spur all of us on to try to make sure we do our best to maximise the improvements for, for everybody across the piece. So, uh, there's no other members in the kitchen speaker. At least yourself, Michael Clare, you have enough to do. Uh, you made your presentation and give us the update, and yes. quite positive that is. So, can I welcome the, all of that on behalf of the committee and thank you for you being here this morning and dealing with members' questions as well. And okay. good luck in the own. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Okay, members, moving on then to the next item on the agenda, which is the uh, item for six is housing allocation. We're going to do a departmental briefing on this. Department of Consultants, actually. Um, so, could I formally uh, welcome then Dear Ward, Dr. Heloise Brown. Mr. Paddy Gray, Ursula McAnulty, and Michaela Keenan. We can have you all just take your seat at the table there, please. Discussions there, but maybe ran over a little bit more than we thought. Um, so, without any further ado, I mean, I think members have all the kind of necessary reports and paperwork in front of them, or electronic paperwork. Um, so, without any further ado, then, can I invite yourself, Jerry, and your colleagues to brief the committee on okay. the work you're involved in? Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to brief <coughs> the committee. I'm accompanied today by Professor Paddy Gray and uh, Michaela Keenan and Ursula McNulty from the University of Ulster, who in conjunction with the University of Cambridge carried out the research on housing allocations and produced the reports, and also by Heloise Brown, DSD Policy Lead for the Allocations Review. The researchers are here today to brief the committee on their findings and recommendations. So I firstly provide the committee with a brief background to the review, explaining the rationale for it before I, we take questions. The department's housing strategy facing the future indicates the commitment to undertake a fundamental review of the social housing allocations policy. The current housing selection scheme operated by the Housing Executive has not been reviewed since 2000. The Department wishes to ensure that the mechanism for allocating social homes represents the most efficient and effective use of the scarce public resource. The scope of the review is social housing allocation policy, i.e. how social housing is accessed and allocated. Related issues such as the supply of new build social housing or wider housing supply <coughs> issues are outside the scope of this review. The work on the new build social housing and housing supply is being taken forward by the Department in line with the Programme for Government and the Department's housing strategy, but the research presented to you today is focused on how social housing allocations are made. The question we have effectively asked the consultants to answer is, can the current process for accessing and allocating social homes be improved in any way? We were keen to get an independent external analysis and that's why we commissioned academic expertise. We asked the consultants to produce three reports on the current process in Northern Ireland, best practice in GB and the Republic of Ireland and finally recommendations for the improvements to the current system. We also asked the, concern, the consultants to consider if and how factors additional to housing need might be taken into account or if the focus should remain on housing need alone. 
Our findings from the housing strategy consultation were that stakeholders were evenly split regarding whether housing needs should remain the only factor for consideration or whether housing need plus and other factors should be considered. I want to be clear here that the issue is not about moving away from allocating by greatest housing need, but whether the consideration should be needs plus other factors such as whether we can enable a more balanced communities and reduced area-based deprivation. However, we're very aware that this issue is contentious and not a straightforward one to address. The reports were launched for public consultation on the 10th of December in 2013. Because the reports contain the independent recommendations of the academic team, the department has not taken a view on the recommendations at this stage. Given the sensitivity around social housing allocations as an issue, DSD has published the independent proposals to provide an opportunity to gather stakeholder views before reaching a departmental position on the way forward. We have invited stakeholders <coughs> and the public to comment on the reports over a 12-week consultation period which closes on the 4th of March this year. The findings from this public comment exercise will be used to inform the Department's view of the review of social housing allocation policy and we will of course keep the committee informed as to the review progresses, particularly when the Department's proposals are published for consultation. Finally, I should emphasise that the Department has not taken a view on the academics' proposals at this stage, so the research team are better placed to explain the detail and intent of their specific recommendations, but we do feel that the research team has delivered a thorough, detailed and well-evidenced set of reports, which will be of value to us in beginning the public debate on this subject and will ultimately inform and evidence our own review. So I'd like now to hand over to Professor Paddy Gray, who's going to um, give some detail on the research. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Deidre, uh, and thank you for introducing the members of the university team. But just again for members, just to mention, it's uh, Dr. Uh, Michaela Keenan, who's on my left here, and Ursula McAnulty, who's on my right here. If you can see her in the corner. Um, can I thank you, Chairman and Committee members, for the invitation to discuss your research and recommendations with you today. If you're content, I will briefly set out our approach to this piece of work and the main recommendations before taking any questions that you may have. You will see that the three reports were completed by ourselves in partnership with the research team from the Centre for Housing and Planning Research at the University of Cambridge. This work included desk research into current practice in Northern Ireland, best practice across Britain and the Republic of Ireland, and recommendations for improvements to the current process in Northern Ireland. We had significant engagement with stakeholders in Northern Ireland and with representatives of political parties here in undertaking this research, and the finished result reflects the issues that were raised with us. Most important among these was the need to make the allocation system more transparent, fair and easy to understand so that everyone can engage with it. We have aimed to deliver proposals that will help people to make informed decisions about their housing options and have clear information about what is available. You will see from some of the key messages in the executive summary to the reports that demand for social housing persistently outstrips supply in Northern Ireland. It is crucial to ensure that the processes for applying for and letting social housing make the most effective use of the scarce <coughs> public resources that are available. Evidence from elsewhere suggests that adopting a proactive approach through the use of the hous a housing options service allows housing providers to meet a range of housing need without sole reliance on the social housing sector. This is why our first recommendation in the report is for the introduction of a housing options service in Northern Ireland. This would effectively mean that when a household approaches a social housing provider, that household receives a customer-focused response that looks at the full range of options available across all tenures. This service has been shown to be effective in preventing homelessness and managing expectations in terms of how long it may take to be housed in a given area. There are 16 recommendations in the final report, so I'll not go through each one 
but I will highlight some of the more important ones very briefly. In addition to the Housing Options Service, we have recommended that the scheme for allocating social housing should change to a banded approach rather than the current points-based approach. We have recommended this because evidence from Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland indicates that banded schemes are seen as more transparent and easier for applicants to understand. <coughs> they allow applicants to better judge when they might receive an offer of a social home. This is because under a point system, households may wait on the list and effectively see others jump the queue above them as they are allocated more points. Under a banding system, every applicant is assessed on their housing need and allocated to a band with others in broadly similar levels of need. They then wait in date order or time on list and on a time on list system to rise to the top of the list and receive an offer. Many of the stakeholders we spoke to had raised issues with applicants apparently points chasing under the current system, and this would be largely eliminated under a banding system. Another significant change is our recommendation that the system for letting properties should change. At present, a direct let system is used, which means that applicants wait to receive an offer of a social home and then decide whether or not to accept the specific residence that has been offered to them. We recommend changing to a choice-based letting approach. This would mean an entirely new system in which the available <coughs> properties are publicly advertised and those on the waiting list can specifically uh, can specify which they would, likely to, would be likely to accept. Then the property is offered to the applicant at at or nearest to the top of the list who has expressed an interest in that specific property. This choice-based letting system lets the applicant take the initiative rather than them passively waiting to receive an offer of a home. We are very aware that there will be applicants who will need support in this process and we have made a range of recommendations about the support that will need to be available for this approach to be effective. But the evidence is clear that choice-based letting reduces refusal rates, which in turn means faster relet times and less time with properties sitting empty. There is also evidence that this encourages applicants to extend their geographical, geographic area of choice. A choice-based approach would address many of the shortcomings that our stakeholders raised with the current direct let system. Finally, we were asked in the project specification to consider if and how factors additional to housing need could be taken into account. The final two sections of our recommendations focus on this and we acknowledge that it is not, not a straightforward or simple issue to address. If social housing providers are to give greater emphasis to the creation of a more balanced and sustainable communities, we feel that certain safeguards should be put in place. We have recommended an independent scrutiny panel as the key safeguard. We have recommended that the panel should monitor allocations for each of the 11 housing market areas across Northern Ireland which were identified using existing research. And in the longer term, we have recommended that the panel could oversee a quota system if there was to be a move towards using social housing allocations to deliver more sustainable communities. Just to conclude, I want to emphasise that we have developed these recommendations for the medium to long term as a means of future-proofing any new allocation scheme. We hope that the proposals will be considered in the light of this. It is about where we need to move to in terms of social housing in Northern Ireland, rather than just thinking about current immediate need. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Do you have anything to Okay, so uh, move straight to the members. Then, from, uh, <coughs> Thank you for, for the presentation, and uh, obviously, the, uh, the the report itself uh, th throws up uh, a number of different issues. <coughs> I think, but uh, I, I am a bit concerned that the, the bulk of the the the, the, uh, the choices in the recommendations are based on uh, what existed in the likes of England uh, and down south. And that it doesn't take into consideration uh, the areas of 
uh, severe social need uh, and, and areas of high demand uh, and were I you know that the, the report seems to be drifting away from uh, the delivering housing via allocations or, or new build uh, purely on, on the need thing. I think uh, that, that there's a, in terms of the choice based lattens, and uh, 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 say I've just sort of read the document, but you see, just to give you an example, at the, as we said at present, there's probably less than 100 houses being built in West Belfast. There's a waiting list of 3,587. There's 2,501 of them in housing stress, 1,218 of them are families, 218 of them are elderly, uh, there are 1,198 single people, and there are over 326 uh, in temporary accommodation. Tell me how choice-based Latins, uh, Latins will suit them. Okay, that's, um, what, what we recommended is a system that's actually been operating across GB and in the south of Ireland, and uh, there are many areas where there's severe housing stress in those in those areas as well. Choice based latins gives it means that people. I mean, taking a specific example uh, of um, West Belfast, obviously there is a shortage of housing, and that's not we're, what we're about here. What we're saying is that how can that shortage of housing be allocated? In the first instance, people will be given options. As a housing options approach. So whenever someone applies for a house, they will be given a range of options that may be available to them. It might not necessarily be in the social housing sector. It could be in the private rented sector, it could be through co-ownership, it could be through a number of areas, but that specialist <coughs> advice will be given at the initial stage. So it may well be that those people that are on the waiting list that are shown at present may not necessarily be a true reflection of housing need in that area. And how, how do you work on it? How do you well, I'm just I'm not working it out scientifically. I'm just saying for that actually that the system itself would, at the initial stages, determine uh, if people's needs can be met, other than social housing. Well, let, let, let me give you another scenario, and uh, and taking just across Belfast, yep. uh, in, in, in the terms that uh, you, you you go down the road of choice based Latins, that say for toxic, uh, there are 30 available houses uh, that may be lying empty in Tigers Bay. Uh, that 30 people or 50 people from the new lodge tap in it and say they want to house there. How do you deal with that on the choice based lessons? Well, people have, have suggested they want to live in those houses. Yeah, but no, I'm saying if people do, now you, when you talk about advertising on the cho choice based lessons, people opt for and say, I want to move to Tigers Bay from a new lodge. Uh, there, there's no way in this world, first of all, could they get living there, but secondly, and it could be vice versa. Uh, and then, but the, the other thing is that they they, uh, they they couldn't move any because their lives could be in danger. Of course, yeah. But how do you build that into the choice based lens? I mean, when, when when someone makes a you know what what happens is that they're they're you know when someone actually makes a, a chosen interest in a property, first of all, properties will be advertised that people may not know exist even within their own areas that didn't know that were existing, or maybe in you know in a longer distance than where they had specified they wanted to live. Might not necessarily be Tigers Bay, but you know take the instance that you're saying in Tigers Bay. I would suspect that that advice would be given to the people at the time. Do you really want to move into Tigers Bay? Is this an area there are issues around safety and health? There's a huge in, in uh, parts of North Belfast, uh, that w w what you're really saying is that y y you can't go there uh, because of circumstances, and there's not enough uh, build going on in your particular area, so you're condemned to be living either in hostel accommodation or overcrowded conditions uh, from here to eternity. I think choice based studies is basically giving people that choice to make the decision themselves as to where they want to go. That, that is only based on the, the available properties or available things. Yeah, the, yeah. the fact of life here is, and this, this is probably one of the naive ends of this, the, the, this report, that none of that was taken into consideration when you sat down to do this report. Well, the boys actually, we, we talked <coughs> about... Show me, show me the oh, that, that, that the thing. That well, we talked to a range of stakeholders right across Northern Ireland, and you know the, the evidence that we were receiving from them was that they wanted to move to some sort of a different system, whereby the, the point system as it currently stands is actually the word, you know, which we did mention in the introduction. The point system as it currently stands allows for queue jumping, allows for people chasing points, allows for people maybe remaining on the list for a very long time. This becomes an open and more transparent system. It's a mechanism. It's the delicate social housing. I think, for, I think part of it, Senator Jack, so we bring all our members in. I think the core of the question, if I'm getting it right, is that the current system 
doesn't provide easement for people who are on a waiting list a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Because there isn't enough housing available, it doesn't matter where you charge on that. There's no choice there, really. Uh, it's so limited. So, is there anything in the kind of views or recommendations of the consultation that deals with how do you square the circle whereby people are being continually left on a waiting list forever? And yeah. in some cases, a number of years in quite a stressful housing circumstance. So, so does, is there anything in the report which actually seeks to address the fact that people may well be stuck on a list for a long time because there is no easy choice available to them? So, hard, so they don't get any additional points or they don't get any additional uh, you know, support to get housed, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. So, does the allocation system, it does, currently it doesn't address, it doesn't help at all. So, is there anything? On offer that actually might help to address that. I think that's what the and key is. But, the report, but, sorry, I have other members to bring in, Sammy. So yes. bring in. Sure. Uh, uh, Finally, your point for and I need to move uh, on. Uh, uh, yes, uh, again, the whole report seems to be talking about sorry, uh, moving away from uh, dealing with objective need. Uh, it talks about rewarding people, either employment or who may have a community standing uh, with, with, with their name. I think, but probably the, the thing that, 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 that got to me was uh, that when you describe some of the people on the waiting list, I have to say I've been dealing with housing for 30 years, and it, I deal with it on a day and daily basis, and I'm sure all the members around this table did. I've never heard of anybody refusing a house because it's not en suite. You know, and, and that, that uh, stigmatises people on the waiting list. I know that there, there may be a small group of people say, well, I'm not taking up this new house. The fact that life is on the waiting list here, that people follow new estates, because that offers the best opportunity and possibility of being rehoused. So it gives a false, a false impression of what the waiting lists are, are, are out there, or the people that are on the waiting list, that they will pick and choose. That's certainly not two of the issues that, that I've come across in all the years that I've dealt with. I want to ask you about two specific areas. Um, when the Minister uh, spoke with the Northern Ireland Committee back in April, he was asked about the provision for ex servicemen, and he specifically indicated, in answer to Lady Herman, that part of your work would be gathering evidence on the need and addressing that issue. The report that I read seems very sparse on that. Um, what did you conclude about it? It was covered, I think, if I can just answer that one, it was covered, I think, in the research um, that the team did. We have done some work directly with the housing executive in terms of clarifying how ex-service personnel are treated, um, in terms of clarifying the and how they're considered under the current rules, um, that we think will address some of the concerns that were perhaps raised by stakeholders when they're, because it was felt that we address those within the current guidance. Um, obviously, the decisions of where the rec what the recommendations are in the report are up to the research team. Um, but the department has looked quite actively at alternative ways of addressing those issues yeah. while this research has been going on. But in terms of the research, if you look at page 59 of the first report, it seems really, which is page 112 of the papers, it seems, should I just mention it and move on with no and of attention to the issue at all. I mean, in terms sure, of sure the context, Professor Gray could comment. It's his report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, well, we actually did. Address, that was one of the areas that we'd asked <coughs> stakeholders around was uh, how we would actually deal with ex service personnel. So it was a question that was actually addressed to the stakeholders, and we presented the evidence that came back from that, and there wasn't a significant uh, response that there should be any different approach. To what we were recommending. So the academics had no view to offer. Like you had a minister telling the committee that it was something that he'd specifically charged the academics to address. Um, so where did that go to? Well, we did address it. We actually addressed it in our gathering of evidence. Any of your stakeholders were right service? Sorry, Trevor. I have a number of members. Sorry, just sorry, sorry, folks. Just let me. I have a better number of speakers indicating to speak. We'll actually take them one at a time. Okay. Thank you.
Just to quote what the Minister said to the, to the committee, in setting up that group to do that work, we did specifically task them with looking at the position of former soldiers. It's not just going to look at social housing allocation po policy. They are definitely looking at this issue. That's what the Minister told the, the Northern Ireland Committee. Yeah, so where is the evidence of the academics who are being tasked definitely looking in a wholesome way, uh, in, in a wholesome way at <coughs> this issue? Yeah, well, we went, we went out and spoke to stakeholders. Every stakeholder that we interviewed was asked the question, should some type of increased priority be given to ex-service personnel? And it was fairly evenly split between some say they should, some say they shouldn't. But in the interim, the DSD ha had been working with the housing executive and clarified their position on it. But did, did the academics reach any view? It was fairly evenly split in terms of the results from the stakeholders. About half said increased priorities should be given, and about half yes, said. So you're hiding behind the stakeholders, but what view did the academics reach? I think in the interim period, we carried out the interviews, and in the background, the DSD and the housing executive have clarified the position in terms of the um, rehousing of ex service personnel mm -hmm. in the to interim what effect, period. What effect have they clarified it? It's, it's been clarified with the housing executive in terms of how they treat um, applications for homelessness assistance and applications for social housing, so there are a range of different... Um, but it's clarified to the things. extent that there's no difference made for, for ex-servicemen. Well, they're not at any disadvantage. Well, are they not? Given do, you, do you think that an ex-serviceman could choose, could accept an offer anywhere in Northern Ireland of a social housing offer? But it's not a matter of accepting an offer, I mean, they will make a bid for a property. Under your scheme? Yeah. Yeah. But at present, mm -hmm. do you think that there are certain no-go areas for ex-servicemen? I think there are, me there are measures in place to support certainly so ex-service personnel who are looking for accommodation in Northern Ireland so and to assist that, them in terms of... Where is the reality? Where, where is the problem? reality that there are no-go areas for ex-servicemen reflected in the current policy to help them? It isn't. It's not the short answer. I think in terms of any applicant, they can make a choice of area. And one of the issues that the research <coughs> raises is that the choice of area is limited anyway. It's geographically limited. Um, and that is one of the key issues that affects the, the demand issues that, that we've been talking about. Thank you. OK, Gregory. Yeah. Um, <coughs> very interesting report. Um, uh, just a couple of things I wanted to, to check and then a, a couple of questions. Um, at the back, there, there's a whole series of uh, points of reference, pages 120 to 122. Was that? I take it that was just a standard sort of reference material that was used in compiling the report. Is that right? Yeah. There's about three. Pages, Gregory. 120, 121, and 122 of the main. And what's this uh, on the Just a reference. Just before Annex One. Page 67 of your report. Page 67 on the first report. So page 67 on the first report and page 120 on the electronic pack. Yes, that would have been the references that we would have used in the desk research. On, on the desk research, you know, whenever we were looking at, uh, at uh, other examples and of good practice. Right. Um, it's just, obviously, they're all, as far as I can see, not having looked through every single one of them, they're all quite relevant. Uh, but I noticed the very last one, a 1983 publication, how much discrimination was there under the Unionist regime, 21 to 68? Just wondering what, how, how relevant was that to the report? Well, without, I need to go to the reference of where it's been referenced, but at the, um, I suspect it was at the, the uh, you know, the, the background to the sort of the, the scheme coming into place in the first place. There was a background uh, section. Yeah, I think. from recollection, it was the background to the, 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 the scheme what? was first introduced. Some yeah. information was used from the book. It wasn't like the point of the book, but we maybe got a quote out of it or something right. using the background yeah. section. It's just, well. according to the title of the book, it looked at a period that 
ended some years before the housing executive even came into existence? I think it was basically contextual. You know, just right. but no. Okay. Um, then going, I'm going to have to look at these pages here. According to the published report 72, uh, creating mixed and balanced communities. I don't know what that appears on under other formats. 19? It's on the top of page, Gregory, on the. Uh, 72. 72. 72 electronic. 72 electronic. Yeah. That's 19 in the report. Yeah. Uh. 19 in the report. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I can see. First you know, report, Gregory, yes, the first report. Yeah. First report. Page right. 19. Sorry, it's just, it's just a while to get the handle of this. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Gregory. Yeah, I, I, I mean, looking at that, it, it, you know, it, it looks to me in terms of, you know, that the report is examining uh, how flowing from together building a united community, how uh, to create a mixed and balanced and presumably better community. Would, would that broadly be the thrust of it? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, on, that, on that context, and, and given what I said about the references, was there any, and I don't see this, but was there any examination then on the problems that have existed with the housing executive in terms of its composition down through the years? In the, terms of like the socioeconomic status of the town? No, more the religious the imbalance religion? of, you know, not recruiting Protestants for a number of decades. Well, we weren't really charged with looking at individual organisations and how we were charged no. with how the allocation system itself should be, uh, look, you know, a fundamental review of it. Yeah. So, you know, it could, it's the House that obviously does the allocation system. Yeah, that, that's the point, yeah. But we weren't charged with examining organisations. Such. No, but the housing executive, as you say, they, their job would be to implement what is a fairly robust housing selection scheme. And I would have thought, you know, given the context of the pretty significant number of, of areas that you covered, that if you're looking at creating mixed and balanced communities, that the one organisation that's the largest organisation about trying to do that that you would have made a mention in passing of the composition and the problems that they've had, like given that they've been about for 40 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, as, as I said, we, we provided a, a contextual sort of background and sort of a chronological, <coughs> uh, you know, review of what had gone on in relation to the selection scheme as such. Right. So we didn't obviously feel at the time that we needed to put that in. Right. But would you accept that it is a relevant consideration? Well, only if it affected the how the, the current allocation system is being administered, which we didn't have evidence that that did. No, I, I see that, and and that's why I referred to the robust sort of housing selection scheme, which there hasn't really been any contesting of, uh, in term, terms of the scheme. Um, but you, you didn't think it relevant to mention or or ask why there was such a problem in the composition of the body that carries out, for the most part, three quarters of the allocations yeah. that you're trying to build a mix and balanced community with? Well, we certainly didn't feel that was relevant to do at the time when we were compiling this, and, uh, and there are other organisations, as you know, that there are 30 housing associations as well that allocate yeah, social There are, but, but as, you probably, rightly, as you rightly point, point out, the vast statement there, we would have had to go through all of those organisations. Yeah, but as you point out, the vast <coughs> bulk of allocations are carried out by the housing executive. Yeah, but I think it would have been, it probably wouldn't have been a balanced approach to look at one organisation alone. Sorry, but it wasn't in your remit anyway to discuss that. You know, it's a fair, I mean, you're making a point, yeah. not everybody agrees with that point, but you made the point you're well entitled to do that. I suppose I've given a response, so it's, it wasn't in your. This, you're dealing with housing allocations. Yeah, we weren't dealing with organisations. You're dealing with a council. Yeah, so yeah. Could yeah. That. But the issue isn't whether people agree or disagree, Chairman. No, you're it's a, I mean, you've raised it and you're getting an yeah, answer. Yeah, so. but it's a statistical fact. No, fair enough. Been, what I'm saying is, but been in existence you've for raised over your point. You're years. well entitled to do that, and yeah. you're getting responses. So I'm just drawing the point. It wasn't in the terms of reference to examine other organisations. And we're dealing with uh, the substance of this meeting here this morning is about the housing allocation system. Yeah, but in terms of, of establishing terms of reference, Chairman, you know, come back to the point I made at the start, I would find it difficult 
to understand why a publication that, according to the title, dealt with housing starting almost 100 years ago and finishing 45 years ago I, I, has any relevance to the terms I'm not of reference? Disputing anything. I, I I'm sorry, is, sorry, uh, hello, uh, sorry, Dr. Brown. I'm not disputing anything. Nobody in this room has set the term to reference, so we have no responsibility for that. We're asking the questions, and where I'll just remind people that the substantive item here is the allocation system and the consultations, and we're here to get in the briefing on the basis of the consultations and what recommendations may flow from that. Yeah, that yeah. But okay. in, in terms of creating the mixed and balanced communities, I think that most people would, would like to see. Um, you, you've suggested some alterations, um, and we can see pluses and minuses to, to, to them. But uh, you, you obviously, looking at that, didn't think it appropriate to make any reference to how that selection scheme would be monitored and carried out and the composition of those who do it. Well, we did actually. We made recommendations on how uh, this new scheme that we're actually proposing will be monitored by the introduction of an, of an independent panel. Right. And how would that independent panel be composed? Well, we've explained that in the report. It would be, you know, that actually that independent panel would look and monitor and scrutinise how allocations were taking place in the new system. Right. I mean, currently, there obviously are practices as to how allocations are scrutinised, but we didn't. I mean, in most, in any academic report, said that you would find that you will do a contextual framework as to where you're coming from, and that's why we looked at the framework as to where the. The current allocations system or scheme had actually come from, and how it had been uh, changed over the years. We talked about sustainable and mixed and, and commu communities, not just in the sense of religious terms, but also the tense of socio-economic terms as well, and how we could create more balanced communities. So that again would have been based on research that has been carried out by other people through our desk research analysis. Just one other question in terms of um, of stakeholders. Um, was there any way of trying to analyse um, people with either good or bad experiences in terms of actual allocations, complaints or recommendations about how well they were treated? Well, we did actually talk to the, uh, the Housing Community Network. We talked to tenants groups and uh, we, we asked their views, so they had an opportunity to give us those views. Right. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Becky, Sammy and Michael. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Just raise some um, general points about the report. Uh, the report does uh, acknowledge the somewhat unique political context that that was part of the issues raised and there was agreement over the need to understand the political climate. Um, but then it goes on to say that the political context must not hinder progress, which seems slightly contradictory. It also says the report recognises, and I quote, it must address real and difficult issues if we are to truly devise a responsive allocation scheme that reflects local circumstances. But it then goes on to say that um, it intends to begin with a blank sheet of paper. And just an answer to uh, what Gregory was saying about the uh, publication, I think, from 1921 to 1968, and why you know that's so far back. I mean, I'm old enough to remember, and I thought that was one of the reasons why the executive came into being, because of the previous housing policies. You know, so it was just to make that point. And um, the other uh, question I would ask, um, I was just taking some notes on it. It talks about uh, the notion of building mixed and sustainable communities as more desirable and more progressive than addressing greatest than, than addressing greatest objective need. But it seems to me that the mixed relates primarily to income class, economic status and disabled age, um, you know, rather than actually necessarily dealing with the, the overall problem. And I suppose the last question I would ask is, how do you see the policy recommendations coming out of this study addressing disproportionate levels of housing stress within some communities, because it seems to me that we are working on a, a sort of two-fold um, social housing policy in terms of ethnic stroke religious. Because, and Fra made the point, people in New Lodge cannot or are, are unable to move to Tigers Bay and vice versa. So we are effectively working with two social 
uh, housing um, issues there, um, and, and I suppose two completely different streams in that sense. Hi, can I take the first? Sorry. I actually missed the first question. I've got the second two here. The second, if that's okay. First. First was a point. So I thought it was the second. In terms of um, the system that we have suggested, um, the, the core of this is the Housing Options Service. And this Housing Options Service is highly comprehensive. It, it's what's known now as a wraparound service, where you, you look at an individual or you look at the household and all their needs. We're not specifically dealing with me and my housing needs. Um, and we will look to see what the, what the real and true needs are of that family. And in, in some Housing Options Plus services um, that we see, Integrated in that is employment services, occupational um, therapy and health services. And, and what this is all about is really looking at what, what is best place to find the best housing fit for that individual or that household. Um, and within that housing <coughs> service, <coughs> people will be sign, signposted maybe it could be to co-ownership, it could be in terms of mutual exchanges. There will be a whole raft of things looked at in those. And if we look at, at some of the very recent evidence from, from um, Glasgow that have piloted housing options um, most recently and are rolling it out across, across Glasgow, what they have found that um, only 57% of people now that come in to the housing option service actually go on and make applications. So there's a reduction there. Those housing option services are showing great strides in reducing homelessness and particularly and very importantly um, repeated homelessness. And customer satisfaction levels with these housing option services are extremely high. So when we're looking at the individuals and all their needs, there, there tentatively could be less people actually on that list. In terms of the amount of houses that are available, we can't deal with that. But what, when we put this housing option service alongside choice-based lettings, this choice-based lettings is a highly transparent system. So you and I would know what houses are available, not just in our local area, but the streets aside and the areas around. You can log in and see what exactly is available. It will give you lots of detail about what's available and it will allow everyone to see what's available and to choose perhaps where, where they would like to bid for. In term, and you can actually see what the likelihood is um, of you getting a house. And if you're going to stay in your local area, where there perhaps is limited options at the moment, if, you, if you're prepared to move, and, and what some of the researchers find is that people will consider to move farther um, under choice-based lettings. So all of that information is there, and it's, it's letting, it's being open and transparent and managing people's expectations. It's saying, look, we have no more houses in this street or in this small area, but this is what is available to you. So at least those people that are using the service actually know what's there, because at the moment it's very, very difficult to give that level of transparency and openness to everyone. So that is a big benefit under the current system in terms of um, housing stress um, and, and giving more houses on the ground. We, we can't deal with that, but what we can do is perhaps offer a system that at least will, will show people what is there and what is available. Okay, so we have uh, Sammy and Michael. <coughs> um, I just want to touch quickly on the, the, the point that Jim raised, because I was going to raise it. But um, given that, uh, Patty, you, you seem to have fallen back um, in your defence that this is the view of the majority of people who responded, but given the fact that there's been a clear ministerial commitment that because of the the concerns are all around ex service personnel, etc., that he wished to see this reflected in the housing um, selection scheme. And you know, there, there is evidence as to how it works in other parts of, of um, England. Why did you not take a view on it specifically? The point of thing that Jim made, but which you haven't answered, why did you not take a view? I'm not really worried about what the stakeholders said. Um, there was a, a clear view from the Minister that, um, that there should be some um, priority given <coughs> ways of, of uh, expressing that priority. Um, I noticed from the, the, the paper you did study what happened in other parts of the United Kingdom. Why have you not expressed a view on that? 
Well, we didn't feel it appropriate to express a view. What we did was we actually we were asked to look at this area. Mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah, it was part of the uh, the terms of reference that we actually uh, received. And we asked stakeholders, we looked at other schemes, and we felt that on, on balance there wasn't a robust enough sort of a concrete majority that favoured having some sort of a... But, you know, we, at the end of the day, having some sort of a priority for uh, act service personnel. But at the end of the day, we made a recommendation based on what we had heard, and uh, we didn't feel it was robust. But, you know, the, the report is out for consultation, so... You know, those views can't be expressed, but certainly that's what we were hearing from the range of stakeholders. Right across the board, we weren't hearing it, it wasn't significant. There's some other parts of the report, mind you, where the stakeholders maybe didn't reflect totally what you've said in the report, because you did take a view on it, despite the well, fact that the... Like, well, I'll come to those in a minute or two, but, um, uh, 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 <coughs> you know, you, you were prepared to exp express a view there or to take a stance there that may not have totally reflected um, what the, the, the stakeholders had said. Can I really just, you see, there was a startling figure given in the summary about the number of refusals. Which give the page number it's it's on page 49. Electronic 49? Uh, I don't know what it's like. Page 1. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but 24 offers, 29 percent of offers were accepted. I take it that's first time offers, and that 34 percent of offers were refused. Some 12 percent refused between four and six offers, three percent seven or more offers, and 33 percent of applicants didn't give any reason for uh, why they refused um, the, the the offer. <coughs> What size of a sample was that taken over? Is that over all of the housing allocations made by the housing executive in a year, or was this a sample of them, or what? It was, um, it was a specific ad hoc piece of research, I think, that the housing executive did, and I, it may have been, I think, about a thousand cases they looked at in a bit more detail to get some more information on, so it's not a representative figure, but it clearly was enough to give an Was this a random sample responses. taken? Um, I will go back and look at the detail of that, certainly. Um, but it was to inform their view on, on the number of refusals and how better to manage the refusals at the time. And it is, it is slightly dated. It's six years old at this stage. But we did feel that it was six. worthy of looking at again. What it does show is that, um, that, that despite the fact that there are a lot of people on the waiting list, there appears, it appears that you know, while they're on the waiting list, they can take it or leave it if they get a housing executive house. And that, that does worry me um, when it comes to the recommendation that we move to, to um, a, a choice-based um, letting system. Because, and my, my concerns are threefold, maybe you could answer them. What happens? The report identifies that where you get hard let properties, that gradually starts to impact on other parts of the estate that are not hard to let because once you get a core of it, then it stigmatises an area. If you move to a choice-based um, uh, letting policy, what happens to those hard to let areas if it's really up to, I mean, if a large section, according to what we have here, if a large section of those who are in the housing executive waiting list are there, if they can get a house dead on, if they can't get a house well, they'll, they'll refuse, or the one that suits them, they'll refuse it. Do we then find that hard to let areas become impossible to let, and the areas around them then become hard to let as well because you're leaving it up to people's choice? I think my understanding of the the recommendations that the researchers have made is that if you do choice-based letting and you advertise a property, you're effectively, you're effectively advertising it to the whole of the waiting list at once. So rather than working down by need, you can save all, everyone on the who would take this property in this area, and that should reduce your relet time, because everyone who's interested in a property can take a look and can but apply hard, for it. Hard to let um, properties are not hard to let because of the relet time. Hard to let properties are there because people have a certain view of what mm -hmm. the locality is like or whatever. Mm -hmm. If it reduces the time of property sitting empty, I can see that that, that would help. Um, oh, hardly. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I don't get the connection, but I can think of hard to let areas um, 
and it's nothing to do with the fact that properties have lain for a long time. It's to do with a whole lot of other factors um, that just the reputation of the area, the perception of the area, um, the look of the place, the stigma which is attached because of certain things that have happened in it, its locality, so, you know, borderline between you know, uh, National Street Unionist area. Now, if we have a, a system of move pr primarily. Well, I recommend. I understand you're not recommended solely um, a, 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 a CBL um, method that you're going to use. But if you move towards that, do those hard to let areas then not become impossible, and and the the the, the problems with them then extend out um, further? Because nobody's who's going to choose them. If that's the, if that's the basis on which you're putting them on the market, up to your up to choice, and the very fact that they're hard to let already means that nobody bothers with them. Can I maybe just come in on that? And I think um, choice-based letting has traditionally been associated with low demand areas and or have been used as a mechanism in order to sort of get increased interest in these hard to let areas. Um, in these hard to let areas, the properties are going to be advertised on a website or an interface of some sort. Um, people, for example, who have been classed as having very low levels of housing need, they would be the type of people who we would see moving into the area. I mean, the issue of antisocial behaviour or, or poor, stick, poor um, effects of an area or stigma, it's beyond the remit of this research. We're trying to see how we can best deal with re-letting difficult to let areas. And the feeling is that if those with very, who have been classed as very low levels of um, housing need might have been looking within a high demand area, they're not going to get housed realistically anyway soon. If they see a property advertised on the internet, they could bid for it and will get that property thereby getting their chances of getting housed somewhere um, will, be, will be quickened. Well, as, uh, um, um, that's not my experience, because this brings me to the second question. If we move to a, a, a system which is where people choose where they want to, to live in, it's a, that's, it's a good system in theory, but if you move to that, what's to stop people who currently May have may feel right. I have had my, my second offer. I refuse the next one. I'm off the waiting list. Mm -hmm. What is to stop people if it's purely choice based, just sitting there and sitting there inflating the waiting list with no incentive at all to make a choice <coughs> until the right choice comes along? Do you not finish up with? Houses lying empty because people don't choose them, and a waiting list getting inflated because people now have no longer any incentive to take up what properties are available because the sanction of two refusals is removed from them. The, there, there still would be sanctions in place, and the evidence from <coughs> choice-based lettings um, that we can find out there is that. The tenancies, um, because people have seen the properties and are bidding for properties that they want, that those are actually, and very importantly, are more sustainable tenancies. The people tend to stay there longer, and we will we will still house someone. So we're still taking people off the list. If people decide to sit there and be passive and not to bid, then those houses will go past them. But there will be people on that list that will be bidding, and you have to ask where housing need is for those people that aren't actively bidding. But the bonuses of choice-based lettings is that these is the tenancies that are created because people have actively and proactively you know shown that they want to live there that people will stay there um, and will stay there longer so, and that's very very important the refu <coughs> refusal rates which stakeholders here have, have concerns about refusal rates are seen to be much less because people have actively bid for the properties and at the end of the day um, if you're refusing choice based lettings as well you can still impose sanctions there to, to, to stop that yeah, but according to your own evidence there's a lot of people in this, and this in turn affects housing policy. If you've got a lot of people sitting there waiting on a waiting list, that waiting list is always quoted when it comes to searching for resources for housing or whatever. But if you, if you create a situation where people can sit on a waiting list waiting for the right house or the right, uh, right houses in the right area to come up and offer, it's entirely up to them. It's a passive thing. 
There's no kind of active um, seeking the, the, uh, the, the people out and saying, well, look, there's a house which suits you because it's two bedroom, whatever, and it's in the area of, of your choice. Um, do you not? Are you not in danger of getting the the um, waiting list simply inflated by people who are sitting waiting for the best choice? But yet that still informs us when we come to looking at to look at the uh, demand that there is for housing, okay. and, and especially since there seems to be, um, according to your own statistics here, there seems to be um, a, a, you know, a, a, a tendency for people to do exactly that, even with the system of sanctions that there are in place at present. One thing that I would say, Sally, is that well, there's obviously two dimensions. There's one is why do we have difficult areas in the first place, and you know what part of the report was we'd. Uh, been trying to focus on creating more sustainable communities and sort of favouring communities where maybe people will want to live in those areas. So that's a that's a longer term issue that obviously you know you you would address as politicians. But you know the evidence has shown that that uh, CBL has reduced empty uh, you know empty properties. And if you're reducing empty properties, you're taking people off the waiting list. So it doesn't matter <coughs> whether someone is choosing not to go for that particular property, you're housing someone, so therefore your waiting list is reducing. So the evidence that we have seen across the water has basically been that, that empty property is <coughs> back into use, and, and, and properties in difficult that areas. Um, but I think there's this wider issue of why, what does the current system do? Does it do any different? I mean, does it, you have difficult that areas, you have properties that are laying up there. So what we are suggesting is that this, this new uh, proposals that we're making would actually address that. No, Paddy, but what the, the current system does do is that maybe um, rather than allowing people to sit on a waiting list for uh, you know longer than than what is necessary, if they're made an offer and they know, I get people coming into my um, office and you know I'd say to them, well, now look, you've had two offers, you really ought to consider very seriously this uh, offer now. With a, with a, a, a choice based letting, a letting system, you don't have that. Can just well, well, you, you can have that. You can't have that. You could actually have a system. I mean, we're we're suggesting a mechanism, a system of, of allocating housing. I mean, that could be put in. You could say, right, if you sit on the waiting list for one six months, why are you not applying for housing? Are you in housing need? So you, you, so, so that's that a variation. Be... And well, can we then come to just two other points? Um, the first one is, and again, it's really interesting, and I haven't had time to read through all the report. I take it that there would be some housing that would have to be excluded from this. I mean, for example, you wouldn't put specialist housing on to choice based building list, would you? No, absolutely not. Um, we would foresee that there would be a review of what type of accommodation would be on it. And for example, if we take um, specialist housing for people with dementia, um, we would be suggesting that they would actually sit out on a separate system. Um, in some cases, um, there's bed blocking because we're waiting on two different assessments for people to go into specialist accommodation. The specialist accommodation often has medical um, assessment needs done and another assessment, there's no need for that. We need to try and free up and um, those sorts of systems so they would sit outside. Okay. Uh, well, let me come to something less specific because I know that some of the most successful flat or uh, 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 Accommodation is ones where maybe you, you have, I don't know how you do it under the existing system, but I can think of some blocks of flats where you've, maybe it's just an accident, you maybe have got mostly elderly people in them. Um, it's not specialist accommodation as such, but I might choose to live in that block if it was all 50-year-olds, but I wouldn't choose to live in it if it was mixed with 21-year-olds, people having parties below me or above me. I mean, can you... Under this system, can you allocate um, with, with choice-based thing? If, if the, that house happens to be in an area, can you restrict who applies for it? Or if it's purely choice-based, how do you stop a, you know some young fella who wants to have parties every weekend going in or getting into accommodation, which maybe is mostly mostly elderly? I think, elderly. Okay, I think that there's two methods of doing that. If you have a specific property, for example, it's a ground floor property, you'll be able to specify that only those people in band two with a medical need are able to bid for that particular for both. property. <laughs> If you're talking about an area for, or a block of flats, for example, um, we'll already have the provision for local letting policies. What we're saying is more use should be made of them. So you could apply to have a local letting policy for that particular block of flats 
it could be that it's for only over 55s or you know not under 25s or it could be an area where there's child density issues and you have to take that into consideration but in <coughs> applying for a local lettings policy you need to have a strong rationale and each one must be individually approved by the panel if you are going to do <coughs> some properties and um, from the list but in terms of individual properties you could say when it's being advertised for example it's ground floor only those with a medical need may bid for this and my last question um, was and I, I, I think it's a good thing that people take more responsibility for their own housing and, and, and looking after themselves and everything else but there seems to be a greater emphasis here in, in um, a choice-based letting system of the individual taking the initiative. You know, yeah. here are houses which are available. I I've got to say, and maybe it's because of the nature of the people who all of us deal with. I mean, see people who can look after themselves don't come near us, but people who can't look after themselves come to MLAs, etc. How do you care for people who can't go online or people yeah, like me? A lot of, a lot of <laughs> or, or, people or, who. <coughs> familiar with the internet, people may not have internet access at home or are afraid of it. Or are afraid of it. So there has to be mechanisms for the more vulnerable people, or those who simply just don't have access to the internet. So we have identified some that got an assisted list when somebody applies for um, social housing, they're assessed, are they able to use the internet? What increased assistance might they need? So we there's various methods that can be put in place to assist that person to bid if it's necessary or bidden by proxy on their behalf. You can have text messaging, it can be done by phone, it can be done by paper. You really have, advice or terminals you and social Those security ones. offices, things like that. So you don't need a computer in your home. You can bid for it in your local housing executive office or social security office. So you need those things in place in order for an online CBL system to be successful. And there's many examples of that in England of different ways of helping the more vulnerable to sort of engage and interact with the system. The system itself can actually bid, be programmed to bid for that person as well, mm. or, or a housing professional can do those bids. So, it, you know, it's something that can easily be built into the system and it's something that's fundamental. And one of the other things just to say on the back of that is that the system itself can be monitored so you can actually monitor the system to see and it's very important who is bidding and maybe who isn't bidding and then look at the reasons for that so that's all very easy done because it's so transparent um, and then you can you know review all that and build in additional safeguards okay i think okay i mean i don't have any other members to speak in uh, just to I'll sort of stick my neck a little bit i'm not so sure that we have substantively dealt with the, the kind of yeah, consultation know. process and some of the recommendations are that but clearly everybody has very important issues to raise and something that we will certainly have to return to clearly from where i'm sitting i think there's a an over preponderance from the report which tells us that they really deal with an area where there's nearly an oversupply or you know there's more houses than people on need um or on the list and i don't see enough evidence that's dealing with the question of how do you deal with a situation where we have in a number of areas which is quite acute uh, where there is clearly an under supply of homes for people who are on the list and I don't see that being dealt with and I don't see any sanction both on the department or the government or the exactly or anybody else for someone on the list because they have no choice to move out of that area. So I just don't see that being properly dealt with in the report. But as I say, it's just something that's just my opinion on it. We need to come back to this as a committee to discuss this. Well, just on, on what I've listened to, um, Chairman, and, and in terms of the CBL, there's a presumption that a lot of our houses are hard to let. But I just said to Sammy privately here, most of the people, if there's a popular house in popular areas, the residents in that area know they're coming vacant before the housing safety. And that house is allocated, basically, as soon as the person leaves it. So, and I'm hearing today from the academics that this will prevent these houses sitting empty so long. But the only ones that are still going to be empty is the ones we know with multiple offers, which are the ones that are hard to let anyway. And there, and there are other I, I, I'm concerned about that. That's fairness, we didn't, we didn't say that at all. We, we well, actually, well, I see somebody did. No, no, what we did was we addressed an issue of vacant properties that was asked. Mm -hmm. it was a specific yeah. question was asked mm -hmm. about what would you do in, our, in difficult of that area, sir, of vacant properties. Well, but I have to say, what you did say, that didn't satisfy me, because at, at the moment, in difficult of that area, you have layers of multiple offer. But that doesn't necessarily address the issue whether someone's going to take the property. 
And just because someone's in your system on this CVL system, if it's going to be difficult to let on the current system, it's going to be equally as difficult to let under your system. Well, all we're saying is that the evidence in other areas has shown that actually empty properties has come, have come down and empty properties in difficult yeah. areas. Yeah, but part of the evidence and your evidence makes it also, if you look at it as uh, in comparison to England compared to here, which I didn't, didn't see in the report, there's nothing to say statistically how long the majority of our properties sit empty, which I think the popular ones don't sit empty, the uptake in them is quite quick. But in other areas in England, because they operate this system, they may be taking slightly longer than we have in ours. I think we also will have to recognise that, I mean, we are all, without a saying it, I mean, there are particular difficulties that we face in communities here which aren't addressed really in that. So, what may apply in England, usually, doesn't necessarily follow that it'll be resolved here. That's the point that everybody's kind of scratching the surface on. So, anyway, it's something we will have to return to. So, can I thank yourselves for being here this morning, presenting the report, taking the members' questions, and Hopefully we'll let a bit of your expertise again in the time ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. members, we've been swiftly on to the next item, which is correspondence. Okay. Uh, I want to draw your attention to uh, yeah. table item page 31. And it's just an update on the January monitoring round, specifically regards a late bid for the AP for 1.5 million capital fund for urban regeneration and community development group. Uh, so, are members happy enough to note that? Okay, and if anybody else wants to raise anything else on the correspondence, and if not, just then members content to note the correspondence memo. Thank you. Then, the next item for the work programme is just to advise uh, the committee that the uh, the revised for more programme is included on page 33 of the table items folder, which takes into account meetings that have been postponed to allow for next week's substantial uh, Okay, members happy enough to note that. Yeah. Then moving on then to AOB. Anything under AOB? Any member? No. To record. So then we uh, just simply move the next meeting. It will take place here Thursday the 23rd, 10 a.m. Thank you very much, members. Thank you. Ready room. 29. This is the Northern...